I found out about Matt Jackson in early 2017. they my first time attending Giddy Up, a legendary chopper show held in the New Braunfels, Texas area. Over these last almost six years, I have admired and been inspired by his passion for building, riding, and creating community in the world of motorcycles, and more importantly, Texas. I spent some time with Matt in his Austin, Texas shop. I got to see firsthand how he works with and around his crew. And hanging from the walls and rafters of the shop are sentiments of what seems like the glory days of choppers. There's inspiration everywhere you look, and I can't help but think that this environment plays a part in the outcome of the builds that are created under that roof. In this episode, Matt and I dig into his past, growing up on a ranch in South Texas' Rio Grande Valley. About this time, playing in hardcore bands touring all over the U.S. and other countries, to acquiring and honing his fabrication skills that helped usher in some of Texas's most iconic vintage choppers. This podcast is long overdue, yet I'm honored to have Matt of Jackson's Choppers on as our first mobile video podcast. I hope you guys enjoy, and thank you for watching the Fast Life Podcast. Well, dude, thanks for doing this, man. I know it's been a... It's been a long time coming. We've been talking for a while about doing it, and uh, I'm glad that we're doing it this way, though. This is a new thing for us that uh, I've never done before, like doing video on the road, and um, I think it's pretty cool. It's a good vibe. It feels like it looks good in the cameras. It feels like it's, you know, everybody's shop is going to be kind of like their personality as well, so I think it kind of lends more to the guest instead of myself, you know what I mean? For sure, yeah. Like our other videos. Gives you a feel of it, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's going to be some kinks to work out and shit, but I think for the most part, uh, and it's not easy. I mean, you saw the shit that I had to bring in here. So. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Keeping it on the road. But, man, I, I've listened to Danger Dan. I've listened to the Big Truth podcast on you. I've watched all your Born Free stuff over the years. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, like, pieces to your story in all of these uh, podcasts and these, these videos and stuff. And um, I just <laughs> I figured we could, uh, we could just kind of do the, re- the run back situation. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you want to do that again? <laughs> no, it's all good. Okay. This is the real. This there is the now. He laid down on his blanket now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, from what I gathered in a lot of these different uh, episodes of things I've listened to on you, you you grew up in South Texas, but what part? Like, uh, I grew up in Falfurious, Texas. Uh-huh. It's uh, right there, like, when you're coming back from the valley. Uh-huh. Uh, What's considered the, the valley down here? Uh, the valley is the Rio Grande Valley. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay. And... Um, a lot of my family, I mean, that's where all my family's from. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my mom's from Donna, which is right down there, and mm-hmm. Raymondville. And my uh, my stepdad's from Raymondville. And then uh, my stepdad managed a ranch mm-hmm. in Falfurious, which is right there at the Border Patrol when you come back from the valley. Okay. So well, That's cool. So, you know, I know that, like, Basically, the the podcast that you did with the the Big Truth podcast, like y'all talked a lot about the music side of you coming up and the hardcore. Like, how did you even get into that? Like, from a ranch to into like hardcore music, that seems like a strange transition, yeah. a little bit maybe. Yeah, but I mean, I uh, I, I don't know. I've always just kind of done things a little differently, yeah. I guess. Um, but yeah, it's funny because I'll I'll talk to you know friends of mine and and try to explain to them my my upbringing and and just being on a ranch in the middle of nowhere yeah. you know and and throwing a football on the roof and catching it yeah, to play, yeah. you know play catch and shit like that and um and it's funny because like it blows people's mind that haven't experienced anything like that because i never got to grow up in a neighborhood or city yeah, kids with yep. kids around and you know if someone was going to come and hang out with me or whatever like as a kid they had to go we were like five miles outside of town, yeah, small town, and then another 
three miles or so into a ranch. Mm. And so it was, you know, it's, you, you didn't have like neighborhood kids you grew up yeah. with and stuff. So I, I spent a lot of time, you know, by myself and th- things that like you look back on now where, uh, what I can imagine, I don't have kids, but I can imagine like, yeah. you know, parents are very protective of their kids and stuff. But I remember being, geez, I don't even know. I mean, my whole time as, <laughs> as a kid, like being able to take, you know, a rifle or a gun and, yeah. and get on a, a four wheeler or just walk off on like it was 1500 acres. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like Damn. I, I That's could go explore for, <laughs> for hours, you know, for a day as or long two. as I, yeah, as long as like, as long as I came back, yeah. you know, as long as I came back around dark, that's what, you know, mattered. Yeah. 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 That's what my parents were cool with. So it, it's definitely a different experience than I think most people have, but. So what do you think was the thing in that time frame that kind of like started uh, exposing you to all these other countercultures and things like that? You know what I mean? Um, being I mean, so secluded from like my my uh my mom and my my stepdad like they listened to good music okay you know like we always had records okay um they loved like black sabbath and acdc and and uh and led zeppelin and and you know that's when i was exposed to a lot of like rock and roll like that like i remember listening to zz top for the first time and stuff and like thinking like oh this is cool you know like and the more aggressive and like heavier the music got the more i was getting into it and you know it just kind of was drawn that way so, um, yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just something I was, I was drawn towards. And, and you know, it, it's a, uh, they were a big part in that. Yeah. The records yeah. they had and the music they were into. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I kind of had the similar situation. My mom was big into a lot of those rock bands and stuff growing up. And, I did, you know, I grew up in the in, in a inner city. So, you know, I had to kind of placate both sides of the fence. I had to be a little hood to, to be able to go to school and not get beat up. But, then let my white out when I got home, basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, we, I remember, I'm, I'm, they're fond days of mine. Just remember my, you know, my family doing stuff like that. Going, we used to go, to, my dad was in a, in a club when I was, my stepdad was when I was a kid. Really? And we used to do field parties and all that shit back in That's the 80s. Awesome. And uh, I never really thought about it much then. You know what I mean? I always thought these guys were broke losers. Like I, I wanted to be like the other people that I had seen that had the suits and the nice Corvette and shit like that. But it was just so, you know, for me, that was just growing up. That was just a perception that I yeah. thought these guys didn't have anything. Where did that change? Uh, it changed um, for me a hundred percent in the, once I started pursuing my own goals and dreams. And once I kind of got anything of similarity success, I realized I didn't and like it. And I understood why the other, the other guys were the way they were, the, why they rode the bikes, why they wanted to go hang out in the field with all their friends rather than go to a club. You know what I'm saying? So, but you know, it's hard to kind of have that perspective young. Yeah. So you know it was I mean? just more alluring back then. Exactly. And then once exactly. you got into it, you realized, Oh, this isn't going to make sense. me happy, you know? Uh huh. Yeah. So, but yeah. So like, you know, I had heard also that you had, you went to college and everything. So being on a ranch, were you going to college to kind of stay within that field of doing ranch works type stuff? Or? No, no. And, it, and you know, it's, it's not something I necessarily took for granted, but like, I mean, as a kid mm-hmm. on a ranch, like we literally, it's like the stereotypes of what people think Texas is, you know, uh-huh. like we rode horses and, uh, and, uh, herded cattle and it was beef master cattle on the ranch. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I grew up doing all these things. Like my, one of my first jobs was driving hunting trucks on the King Ranch in Kingsville, mm. and uh, and my stepdad would run the dogs, and it was like uh, he would lead the hunt, and it would be like a, a dove hunt or a quail hunt, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then I was probably like 13 or 14 driving the hunting truck at you know 5:30 <laughs> in the morning or whatever, <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. But you know, we had people like Nolan Ryan and oh, like shit. you know, uh, I mean, all kinds of people that came out there to like go on hunts at the King Ranch. Yeah. And the King Ranch would hire my stepdad, and then and then he would bring me along oh, that's to, cool. to, to drive the trucks Dude. and stuff. So that was one of my first jobs out there. On a side note, man, did you watch that Nolan Ryan documentary? Oh, it was killer. It was so fucking badass, the dude. the best, dude. And I, I, I was I'm fortunate because I got to pl- see him play when I was a kid. My dad used to take me Same. and everything. And uh made me fucking proud to be a Texan to watch yeah. that thing, man. You know so. what the coolest part of that whole thing was? Huh? When they show him at the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh-huh. And he gets ready to give a speech and stuff, and he, like, starts talking about how – because, I mean, he, he, he was the type of person – he literally made every person he went against, like, every team that wasn't his, yeah, 
he made he looked at them like they were his enemy. Uh huh. And that's what his mindset was. Yeah. And and it was I mean it's one thing for someone to say something like that right, to, but to be that competitive and to like be able to turn it yeah. on like that, and that's why he was so good. And and one thing I found really interesting is when he gives a speech at the at the Hall of Fame or whatever, he like says something like he finally like loosens up a little bit and he's like. Well, now I realize that these guys can be my friends. And that was, like, the first time that he had, like, <laughs> yeah. come to that conclusion. You know, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that was a good one, man. And it just – it pieced a lot together that I didn't – I was too young to understand. And by the time I hit, like, teen, you know, being a teen, like, I, you know, he was already retired and it was Michael Jordan era, you know, at that point. So, but fuck, man, it you know, watching back at all that stuff and just piecing it all together, I was like, God damn, like, that's – he was so good. That's yeah. So good and humble. Uh huh. And just like yeah, I mean like that's everything you you know, you want to uh, idolize uh, uh, yeah. in, in someone who's like a superstar athlete like that. You know. Yeah, for sure, man. But yeah, so you, you know you did the hunt stuff. So what like, what was the thing that started getting you away from that place to where you kind of like started going somewhere else? You know. Well, we so, so what I was getting at with that is uh, is you know like like at the time I feel like it was just normal life for me. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, where we lived and where I grew up, uh, you know, I, um, w- where I grew up, like I was literally like one or two, like of white kids in yeah. predominantly Hispanic, um, uh, school and stuff like that. And, and, and that was something that never, like, it never occurred to me that that was the case. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it was like never was something normal. like, yeah, like I, I can look back and remember being like picked on stuff like that uh-huh. growing up. Because of closer. because of being you know like a white kid at a predominantly Hispanic yeah. school, but like it never was something that uh, that it never really clicked with me until we moved when I was about thirteen. We moved to Corpus Christi, mm-hmm. and that's where I went to high school and stuff. Oh, okay. And um, and then that that was like kind of like a suburb where where I went to high school, and I think the main reasoning for us moving there was for me to play. I was I was real into football and baseball, mm-hmm. and um, and. Uh, I think my parents wanted me to go to a school where, you know, yeah, you're uh, good. where I, where we had where I had uh, more, a more better yeah more opportunities just to because like this we moved to Corpus Christi Cal Allen and they were known known for uh, their four A school uh, as far as like football they were known for going to like the state semifinals yeah. state finals like every year in football Man, nice and I think I think that probably. Uh, was the leading factor in us moving out there? Yeah, and um, and, I, a and I played shock all that. Though? Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, being with that time. much more people that are more urbanized, if you will. Yeah, it was just well, I mean, it was very suburban. Oh, it was. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was very yeah. suburban, and um, and uh, it was definitely a culture shock though. Yeah, and and that's you know like before that I was I was already getting into more aggressive music and like I had gotten into I had I had already gotten a guitar you know and like mm-hmm. started to play guitar stuff like that but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, even even with the upbringing I had and, and, you know, not spending my time around a lot of kids my age and stuff, like, mm-hmm. I still was able to, I don't know, I've always just kind of gone towards that yeah. kind of thing, you know? Yeah, like, I hear you. Well, yes, yeah, that's, that's crazy, man, because, I, like, I, I think about a lot of the things that, like, really influenced me at, at, at my high school, you know, ages and stuff like that, and I got really big into skateboarding, like, the last couple of years of my high school. And I grew up playing sports, so it was, like, weird for all my jock friends to see me, like, go from wearing Jordans to wearing Etnies and shit like that. And, yeah. And being the guy outside of the school with the other guys, you know, trying to do a kickflip down a four stair, you know what I mean? So it, yeah. was, it was different, but it opened my eyes to a lot more, uh, just another part of the, like, just another way to be, you know? For and, sure. And that's It what, gives you another perspective, you know? And uh, I think that's, like, like, that was the one thing that worked, I guess, in my favor – or as when I look back on mm-hmm. on high school stuff like that, like I, I played sports um, all through high yeah. school. Uh, I had the opportunity to play football after high school, and um, and I was just over it. And I didn't yeah. want to do it anymore. And um, but uh, like looking back, like I I I was good at sports. I played sports, but I still had friends that like I was playing in. I was playing music with friends like you know, starting a punk band when I was yeah, in high yeah. school, you know? And so, like, I, I felt like I was a good kind of bridge between the two different cultures yeah. as far as, like, you know how things are in school, I guess. But, um, and, but you know, I never really fit in in either one of them. Yeah. You know, it was always just kind of, 
I've always just kind of been like Bounced an outlier, around, yeah. you know? Man, I, I would imagine, because I've never played music per se. Uh, I'm just a connoisseur of absorbing it, if you will. Uh, but it's got to be an equally, like, amazing feeling to be sitting there with a group of guys creating some sound that, like, once it all starts flowing together, it becomes just like a, a sports when you're up, you know, when things are going well, you know what I mean? So I imagine it got to have some similarities of highs. Yeah, you know? it's, uh, it's definitely – the. Um, I mean, there's nothing else like it, man. And 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 I had the opportunity to play with with some with some guys that you know we we uh we got to go to a lot of places and mm-hmm. and and I got to be a part of something pretty special. Yeah. Um. But uh, the only thing that was somewhat even close to you know playing on stage in front of a yeah. shit ton of people that are going nuts and having having a great time and yeah. like in like you know you're you know you're playing you're like creating something that's you know, the, you know, is special, but you never know how other people are going to react to it or whatever. Yeah. But like, it's just the only the only feeling like that that was even close to being similar was uh, when I when I put together my first chopper, you know, yeah, and rode down the road, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm yeah. riding this bike. 70 miles an hour and I put this together <laughs> you know and I'm like this is sketchy as fuck yeah you know <laughs> it's on the edge of yeah and then You're once I had edge. that feeling I was like I was done with everything else that's all I wanted to do uh-huh. was work on bikes and and put my own bikes together and ride motorcycles but and, you, uh, you toured and traveled quite a bit before you even got into the bike thing yeah, right? yeah for sure so, yeah where yeah. was it on the line like in that you know because I know that your first bike was the 82 FXR right yeah, yeah. and uh so was it being around all these other people in bands and in the music scene that kind of like inspired you to jump on the first bike kind of thing or no one of my good friends uh Nick who's still one of my good friends today and he uh he actually manages the Austin Speed Shop okay um he he really got into it and and i mean when he got into it he went like yeah, full on into it man and he uh he i remember him putting together his 68 shovel that he still has generator shovel which is Probably, you know, uh, generator shovels are probably my favorite. Yeah. Harley motor and, and uh, have been some of my favorite bikes. But um, when he started putting his bike together, I mean, I had never seen somebody piece something together from the ground up. And, yeah. and he was just learning it and, uh, and starting out with it. And I was fortunate enough to be there and, and, and you know, see him doing it and help him out where I could. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, we were just, like, hooked on it, man. Like, once I figured out that, like, there was something I could do like that where I didn't have to – rely on you know three or four other people yeah. like when you do with a band and try to get people yeah. to practice and then you know like oh you get some success and like you know you like you you want to start touring or something and you have a record out and then like half the guys can't do it or whatever like i i just got to a point where when i found something like that they gave me that same kind of rush yeah like yeah. riding a old foot clutch jockey shift you know <laughs> chopper that i put together yeah that i'm thinking like I should probably not be doing this, you know, yeah. like you got that, that same rush, that adrenaline rush. And, uh, and I was like, but I can do this on my own, you know? And so that's a good point because I, you know, my little brother had a band and it got to a point where we were like, fuck, like we were all making fun of him at first. And then it's like, yo, that sounds good. Like I'll jam that. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. And I saw the same thing happen where like trying to get just three other people, you know, alone just get them on the same page with the same kind of energy the same kind of enthusiasm and commitment to creating something like that's like lightning in the bottle type shit you know what i mean like you could have the best sound and the best the best everything but if you don't all three want the same things to grow a band i I could imagine i'm I'm speaking out from the outside looking in that that would be like that'd be painful to be you know to be good and not not have the same effort yeah, everybody. You that know? definitely makes it difficult. I think the I think the thing that that uh, to me that I've I've experienced that's most um, that helps a band be successful is when you have somebody that's the main creative force, like the writing force, you know, yeah. and then everybody else kind of assists in that process. Yeah, and so like the uh, um, I was in a handful of bands, but uh, one band that I that we did a lot of touring and, and traveling and stuff, and was, uh, was called Iron Age. Uh-huh. And um, and my good friend uh, Wade Allison was that person, and and uh, and then our singer Jason Tarpey, um, and they they did like ninety nine percent of the writing and stuff. And uh, they uh, to me like when you have a band mm-hmm. and you have like 
a major creative force, you know, who's bringing like the main ideas to the table yeah. and, and, and doing most of the writing and you, and you're lucky enough to have somebody that creative involved mm -hmm. that can do all that. And, and, you know, like I was just kind of along for the ride. Yeah, and and yeah. to me that, that, that actually alleviates a lot of the, uh, the stress of, you know, getting everybody together to create something and you're relying on each other and whatever. And, uh, whereas this was more of like, we were all into that same kind of music. We were, mm -hmm. you know, we all had different influences and stuff, but, uh, it's what we wanted to do. We mm -hmm. wanted to tour, you know, we wanted to travel the world and, and we got to, and, and, uh, and I think when, ha when you have somebody that's like a main creative force like that, yeah, it, it really, uh, it's easy you for know, everybody to rally behind him. For sure. You know what I for mean? For sure. And Especially when it's somebody that you're like, damn, this is like, I mean, it, cause even at the time, like for us, um, I can remember like, you know, when Wade would bring a riff to, to practice or something or, or have a full song laid out and stuff. I just remember thinking like, damn, this is, this is fucking cool. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know what's going to come of it, but like, this is fucking cool. Like I like this. This uh -huh. is like, this is what I want to be doing, you know? So. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that kind of uh that kind of ushered you into, you know, getting into the chopper thing and it's it's I think it's I, I'm envious of the fact that like you found choppers first versus I've been in a lot of different bike scenes in the last twenty years, you know, from sport bikes to billet choppers before and big wheels and I've chased the money for a while until I fell in love with bikes. And that's kind of also to go back to the whole when I realized certain things that was kind of the, the, the time frame, yeah. you know, and was realizing, okay, I was chasing the big money bikes and trying to be like the big money guys in the bike industry. And I was not in love with motorcycles. I was in love with whatever, you know, idea of who I was because of it, as opposed to just being stoked about a, a finished project and riding it or traveling on it or enjoying what you made with somebody or, or, or what you have, you know? So that's kind of the thing that I, I, like I said, I'm envious of the fact that you found something that's much more, has a lot more soul to it. Yeah. Off the rip than, you know. I think that kind of goes hand in hand with like the background of being into punk rock and like, you know, underground, uh, just different underground lifestyle yeah. kind of stuff. Cause, uh, and I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I, la I kind of laugh about it now cause I'm like, it's a detriment to me now. Right. But like, man, I've just like, I've never been into money. I've never had money. Yeah. I've like, like, I've never, idolized money you know and like and then all the people and, and as i say that now i mean i'm a grown man with a business and mm -hmm. stuff and i'm like man this is like the things i shouldn't be saying right <laughs> but like everybody i've ever idolized yeah. you know like have died without a penny to their name you know and, yeah. and uh and but the things that they did to me like i know that it's it's things that I've talked about probably every day for since since they've been gone, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I could sit here and name, you know, 10 plus people like that. Yeah. And it took me a little while to, like, sit down and think about that and be like, because, I mean, like I said, I just like I understand where you're coming from with that. Yeah. And uh, but it's just that was never my thing. And I wish it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it, often, you know, yeah. when my bills come up, I'm like, fuck, I wish that's what I was into. Um, but it's just never been something that's made me yeah. like happy. You know what I mean? Like, like, sure. I'm glad when I get paid for the work I do, but, uh, but it's just never been something that I've chased. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know what that says about me, but it, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's never really been a thought for me. Trust me. It's much more healthy. I mean, I didn't come up, I didn't grow up with money either, but I just, like I said, I put certain things on a pedestal and I wanted to have them. And I, I feel like when I first started making and when I talk about money, I'm talking like when I first started making 40 grand a year, I'm like, you know, fuck bills. I'm trying to buy the shit I couldn't afford whenever I didn't have money, you know. So I'm out there being hood rich as fuck, just doing whatever I can to look like I have money and just ignorant shit. You know what I mean? So, but it's one of those things that like, you know, I, I struggle with it because I don't necessarily, I, I hate what money brings to things, but I also like to feel like you know, my, my kids are okay. My wife's okay. You know, like I'm not going to go on a bike trip and come home and I don't have a shop anymore or, you know, those yeah. kind of things. And that's the double edged I mean? sword, right? Like that's the, that's the, the thing that I like that I'm, that I am kind of laughing at, um, ironically to myself <laughs> yeah. is like, like that's where I wish I had, I, I wish that I was like, you know, like 
more into that aspect of it. Um, you know, it's taken uh, uh, Reed that works with me. He, uh, you know, he's had to tell me several times, like, hey, Matt, you need to charge people more for this. Like, yeah. what you're about to charge, like, you need to be charging more for this. Because the other aspect is, is I've never, um, I've never, that just closed, does that matter? Oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> My bad. Um, the other thing is, is like, I've never taken, really taken my, I've never taken my, a bike I've had to a shop, right? Yeah. So you, t- you have a tendency to like, think in terms of like, you know, and I know this is not the way to run a business, but like, you have a tendency to think in terms of, of, um, you know, like, I think about what, when I look at a bill or something laid out for somebody, I'm like, shit, that's a lot of money, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I've had to really, it's, it's taken other people it's you know, talk me through it and be like, you know, like curb that kind of thinking because, you know, like Reed actually brought a, a, a great perspective to it for me because he's, he's, he grew up in, uh, in Denver and then he lived in New York for about uh, three or so years. And then he moved down here to start working with me. Mm-hmm. And that was over two years ago now. Mm-hmm. And, when I see something like a bill that we're giving somebody or something and I'm like, like that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking in terms of myself. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, and I know that's not the way you think, right. Yeah, that's yeah. not how you're supposed to think, but it's, it's been a good thing with him because he's like, look, Matt, I took my FXR to a shop in New York and I paid this, this, and this. And these guys were like, Hey, if you can't pay this, this is my bike, you know, yeah. or whatever. Right. Like he's like, and growing up in Denver, like the guys he would take his bike to before he started working on his own stuff, whatever, you know, just getting a different perspective like that. I'm like, yeah. okay, okay. He's like, you got to stop being so nice to people, you know, like and don't think of it in terms of yours, you know, because that's what really got me into working on stuff was once I got my first bike, you know, things broke on it. And I'm like, shit. And I'm like, well, now I can't, I just spent all this money on this bike, all the money I had. Right. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I can't pay to take it to somebody, you know, like, so I need to figure this shit out. Yeah. And that's exactly the, what happened with me too. I mean, I was in the same boat. I, I think that it's an age thing. Like I think that some of my fond, most fondest memories in my life have been working on whether it's my bike or a buddy's bike or whatever in the garage before we go on a ride the next day or a trip or whatever. Some of the best times of my life have been that. And of course I'm not going to be like, all right, Hey dude, that's a thousand bucks for yesterday's. It's like, no, nah, dude, let's get this fucking thing to work and let's get on the road tomorrow. And so you enjoy that so much. And then there comes this time where it's like you still enjoy working on bikes, but you got to be responsible. And then it gets even harder because you still have those times you want to just jam out on a bike for a homie or whatever. But, you know, like where do you draw the line or where do you raise the bar, or lower the bar? Like it's such a, a hard thing to do. And uh, trust me, in my later years, it's gotten more complicated to to do that, especially with friends and people that I've known for a long time or, you yeah. know, well, when everybody starts to kind of become your friend, right? Exactly. Cause I say that a lot. And like my, my wife and like Reed and, and Robert, like they'll, you know, I'll say something like, Oh, this is, this is one of my, you know, one of my buddies, like when, and they're like, is it really your buddy? You know, yeah. like, is he just like, I don't know. Like I, I feel fortunate enough to meet people, you know, all the time through all this. And like, and like, you know, you, you instantly have, a common ground, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and you have to sort through all that stuff, you yeah, know, like it, yeah. it takes different perspectives and that's, that's, what's nice is, is to have, you know, be able to listen to other perspectives and, and, and incorporate it into your mindset already. Yeah. But I, but I have had trouble with that, you know, cause I'll be like, well, this is my buddy. And I'm like, yeah. and then someone will say, well, is it really your buddy? I'm like, yeah, kind of, but I'm, they're like, either way you need to be charging what you're charging. You know, you need to charge what, the work is worth sometimes you know? it's like uh it's it's like how you start that friendship is how it's almost going to always be expected right so yeah. if you if he, he is a customer he is a friend or if he's someone that you've rode with and then well i guess to back it up like what i had to do is basically i've had groups of friends i was cl- close with and cool with and they just never quite got over that pa- fact of like look i have to charge for this now i can't i can't give you eight hours of my day for free because we're friends you know so I had to get rid of a lot of friends for that reason. I had to start fresh and let the new ones know, look, this is what I do for a living. You do what you do for a living. And if you want something, you know, I'll do, I'll cut you a deal when I can. It's going to be hard to cut labor, but if I'm selling you a part, maybe I can give you a little bit off here and there, maybe depending on the part and the situation, right? Everything is situational. So 
you know. You know, I mean, and, and we have a tendency to look at, and that's the other mindset I had to get out of, just like that, you know. And it's, and you're right, it sets you set the, you set the standard from your initial interaction, yeah. right? But what you come to realize is, and maybe this is just something of like, it's probably just experience of not of like missing out on a lot of money or work that yeah, I should have yeah. been doing or whatever. Right. But like you, you've come to figure out like the people that uh, are looking for those kind of things and, and are, 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 you know, know that they don't have the means to pay for something, but they still want this out of you. Yeah. Um, aren't really your friends. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, trust me, once I started making these changes in my life, dude, I have been, I have been rich with great quality people surrounding me. Friends, customers, uh, the the my my place in the motorcycle air quotes industry has gotten better. You know, it's just I have no bad interactions because I cut out a lot of that bullshit. You know, a lot of it was just me standing up for myself. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes it comes off a little bit arrogant on this podcast, but hey, no, it's it, it's I mean, yeah, I mean that's it's all that's all positive things, you know, and 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 that's what the focus should be on. It shouldn't be on someone trying to you know. Uh, like, like to me, what's the like, what's the the coolest thing you can do for somebody? Like, say your friends. Say, say yeah. you and I are friends, and I want to get a paint job or whatever, right? You know what the most res- like, what would make me feel the best mm-hmm. is being able to pay you yeah. what you deserve and what you ask for in, in in a paint because I'm coming to you because I know you do fucking yeah. awesome paint work, right? Exactly. And and that's the product I want, and I want to especially when it comes to something creative and one off like that. Yeah. Like. I want to, uh, you know, be able to have something that you created and you should be compensated for it. And, and that's part of the, like, that's part of the positivity and the good feelings of being yeah. a friend. Right. I would say it, it on that same note, it's about like, uh, say if I was coming to you for some work, like I want your enthusiasm. Yeah. Like the way that you feel about bikes. Like I want to make sure that the project that, that I'm getting done by you is something that you're fucking stoked about. Because that's when I'm going to get the best version of you. That's when I'm going to get the, the most creative uh, shit from you. And, you know, that's what I want. I want to be able to give that to my friends. I want them to be able to give something that I'm proud of everything I've ever done for them. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. And that's when you do something one-off, right? Like when, like the, the business is where yeah. you're in. When you're doing something one-off, it's like and, – and, and I tell everybody that comes to me for work or whatever, like, like – it doesn't matter if, because I've had customers in the past be like, well, I know this isn't something that you yeah. normally do, right? And I'm pretty good about like telling people no about like yeah. stuff I don't want to do. But at the same time, if it's like something I know I can knock out or whatever, and, and, and it's situational. And I, yeah. yeah, I'll take it on. And, and, you know, and I'll do it to the best of my ability. But yes, the like, you know, when you're able, like, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of customers that, um, that'll come to me and just say, Hey, do what you do, you know? And, and, mm-hmm. and that's where I get like, that's, that's where I become the most creative, you know? And, and uh, or I feel like, you know, like it, it's just a better vibe about the whole thing. Right. Yeah, so you you're, feel you're open. Yeah, yeah. You're just open to like, like, Oh, cool, man. Like, like this person wants something that I'm doing. Right. Or they yeah. like w- how I see things or how, you know, um, you know, like, like the things Your I style, make or whatever yeah. or style. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and it definitely, it definitely puts you in a better mindset. Yeah. Cause yeah. whether or not, like I, I could tell everybody every, every day, like if, if they bring something to me and, and they say, well, this isn't something you normally do. And I, and I'll say, cause I mean it, like I'll, I, and I'll tell them, look, if it's leaving here, mm-hmm. it's going to be the best of my ability. Yeah. Same. Okay. But you know, like, I mean, when I sit and think about it in the back of my mind, like definitely like if I'm not able to be as creative on something or if it's not something that like I'm super into it's it's gonna it's gonna you know it's gonna change it a little bit yeah oh you're good i just making sure the levels are good yeah but yeah sure. that's um one of those situations too so like as far as like you know when you get this bike you start fucking with it yourself fixing things or, or modifying it to fit your you know just trying shit like what were some of the first things that you kind of started doing to tinker with the bike as far as like they started putting you down this path you know what i mean uh i mean right off the bat like when we started um, messing with bikes, like like I was telling you, my, my my good friend Nick, who played in bands with me and stuff, he yeah, you know, he right off the bat he started building this. He, well, he built this really bitchin' uh, Triumph Chopper, mm-hmm. and I mean, like right out of the gate, you know, he was he's the one that like turned me on to like Dice Magazine and stuff like that, yeah. you know, and and so this is probably 
12, 13 years ago, something like that now, 13, I don't know, maybe more. Um, but uh, so, like, you know, we were instantly into things like that and, and publications like that that were showcasing some pretty yeah. cool choppers and and, uh, and just bikes in general, you know. And so, like, the you know, seeing those things and, like, seeing, like, I remember the first time I saw, like, uh, those, the Hells Angels time life photos, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was before I even had a motorcycle. And I remember looking at that being like, I don't know what that is, but yeah. that's fucking cool, dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, like just seeing the bikes and everything. And just like, I was like, I don't know what, what this, like, I, I'm, you know, like, I, I mean, I had an idea of what it was or whatever, but like, as far as the bikes and whatnot and seeing like, you know, young pictures of slave Louie with his knucklehead. And like, you know, there's that photo of him, you know, getting handcuffed or whatever. And it's time life hell's angels photos. And like, just seeing all that and thinking like, I don't know what that is, but like that's me right there, yeah. dude. Like whatever these guys are, that's me. You know what I mean? That. Yeah, <laughs> I identify with this, you know. And uh, and then you know, then it was full fledged from there. Yeah. So you you would say you probably got into the bike thing what like oh nine eight ten right around there. Yeah, something like that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, eight, no, oh eight, uh, oh eight, something like that. Um, shit, I don't. I've had the shop now for seven eight years, eight seven years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. Uh, when was the when was the uh, Shit. Warren Freeze on 14. Warren Freeze on plus 14. One. Yeah, plus so 15 one. 15 years. Of the one, yeah, yeah, 15 years. So, Born Free 7 was the first one I did. So, okay. that's when I started my shop. So, eight years ago. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's fucking wild, man. Like, uh, you know, those uh, those magazines you just talked about, like like Dice and Show Class, like, those were, like, these underground things that you didn't catch at, like, Barnes & Nobles for me. And so... You know, we'll get into this later, but, like, once I kind of found this kind of other scene going on and I was introduced to that shit, I remember going to Chopper Supply back up in Dallas and there'd be a Dice magazine and a, and, and a, a bunch of show class, like, a whole, like, catalog of those. I'm like, yeah, I'll take all these. Yeah. I, want, I want to absorb all this shit because it's so rad. And uh, as someone that's always, like, photography and all that shit, like, what I loved about those magazines is not just about the articles – but all the advertisements felt like more articles. They For felt sure. like they were, it wasn't like a, someone trying to sell you a big dick pill or some shit or a Harbor Freight ad in the back yeah, of the magazine. Yeah. It was like more bros putting on like biker type shit. You know what I'm saying? For so. sure. And you were just drawn to those. And I mean, it, it's like, I mean, it was, it's similar. It's a similar vibe of like the old Easy Riders magazines, yeah, right? Yeah. Like looking back on all those ads and stuff, man, there was such cool things in there. And like, <laughs> I mean, I got one of my, uh, my, my logo that I use for my shop um, like the font yeah. is from uh, an old Denver's Choppers ad nice. in in Easy Riders, you know, and and uh, just just like, I mean, just so much cool things and so many cool things and inspiration going on in the ad space yeah. of it. Same, yeah, same thing with Show Class Dice. Like, like that's that's how you would find things, you know, and like mm-hmm. this is, you know, before you could just Google everything, but or whatever. I, I mean, know. there was. I mean, when I got into it, I, I you know. I mean, I, I've said it on the podcast a million times, so I'll run down, I'll give it to you. Like, I used to ride cross-country on Big Wheel Baggers, and we were kind of known as the people that did that. Like, because that wasn't a common thing, but there were definitely other people doing it. Yeah. But in the shop space and working on bikes and customizing them, everybody in that world had a dually and a trailer, full like an eight-fucking-bike trailer kind of situation. And we were the guys that would, like, go to Sturgis by way of San Francisco, yeah. you know? And... um we came home, literally came home one day off one of these trips and through somewhere on social media, the 21 Days Under the Sky thing had just dropped on Netflix. I think it was an accident, but it came on Netflix. Yeah, it was on Netflix, yeah. And I literally came, I got home like middle of the day, wife was still at work, so I watched it and I, and I was like, that's so fucking rad and that's exactly what we just did and it's celebrated in this community, riding, doing this type of shit. Yeah. And it wasn't in, in the in the bike scene in the in the bike industry that I was a part of, so I was instantly hooked. Yeah, you know, I, I started searching out people in Dallas. This is in like May of 2018, June of 2016. Uh, sorry, I started searching out like where's where is this in Dallas? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's when I found Chopper Supply and yeah. Chemical Candy and yeah. a lot of those guys. And uh, mealy, I bought a Dyna so that I could ride up to the shop and hang out, not in my fucking 26 front wheel <laughs> stereo system bike. Um, just to kind of be cool with them. And they were all real welcoming and open, you know, minded. And I literally remember that, uh, I met Kenny 
on like a Monday and he invited me to the pre-party for Southern Throwdown in 2016, which was going to be that weekend. And then next thing you know, I'm sitting there at the pre-party and there's Max Schaff. I'm like, fuck, I saw him in, I think it's the six over thing. And I was yeah, like, yeah, for sure. I was starstruck by a lot of these guys that I was just finding like, like I felt like a connection to this, but I had gone down so many years of my life in this other direction that I felt like a poser almost coming into it. So, uh, but yeah, that's just my own little personal fucking thing. No, that's cool, man. That's you cool know? to hear. Yeah, I mean, you take people like that, like, I mean, like, people like Max and stuff, it's it's like, I mean, he's, from what I know about Max, like, he's, he's you know, been successful in a lot of different facets, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, 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 but he's an extremely humble person, man, and, like, and that's, I think that's a lot of the similarities with, like, the, like, punk and metal scene that I grew up in and playing in bands and stuff, like, it wasn't you weren't going to see a band like like I don't think I'd ever been to a big concert until yeah. maybe like three years ago when I my first time of seeing Iron Maiden okay <laughs> and that nice. was like I'd never been to like a big concert yeah, okay yeah. which is as funny as it sounds but like you know like I grew up in a scene where it was like you know you'd go to shows and like you'd idolize these bands and stuff but like when they're done playing, they're just walking around in the crowd, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. uh, and to me, there's just, you know, so much more of a, of, of, a, of a connection there and a feeling there yeah. that, uh, really, you know, uh, really, uh, puts you in tune with it, I think. Yeah. That's probably like something I did like about the other facets of the motorcycle scene was that, you know, you would get these larger than life builders in other areas. And sometimes you would feel like there was like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of caution tape between, that guy and the gen general public that are or the other bikers at Sturgis or something like that. So it just felt cool to be around people that have been on TV and have done all these things and, and had more or less some sort of fame attached to their name, but still sitting there riding, hanging out, drinking beers, like just being normal. You know what I'm saying? And, and not having like this, like a uh, inflated ego based on any kind of success they've had. So I've had to learn all this shit. Like, trust me, I've, you go down 10 years down a path like chasing like the money side of the motorcycle industry and you you kind of you you absorb a lot of like things that you have to unabsorb you have to unlearn that shit or and i still have a little bit of that shit left over my head every once in a while the ego comes out or the or the you know the, the entitlement comes out shit like that but I try to surround myself with people that keep me in check. Yeah, <laughs> you know for what I'm sure. Saying? So, yeah, and yeah. I mean, it's not not to say that there aren't people that you know you'll come across or whatever yeah, that yeah. they don't have the same perspective, right? But like, I mean, everybody. Uh, I mean, one thing I found myself saying often, and in, in pretty much in every aspect of of my life, um, and the things that I've been into is is like like is the way I've gauged success is like when your idols kind of be yeah, become your friends, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and, and I have seen it happen like slowly in, in the, in the things that I've gotten into and whatever. Yeah. And that's the point where I sit back and I'm like, man, like if I have to like, you know, deem something a success or whatever, like that's, what's a success yeah, that, to me. You know what I mean? Success. Like to look around and like, be like, and still like, idolize these people you know yeah. like like max man yeah. like 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 max is someone i look up to very much man and uh, uh um you know he's done so many cool things and mm -hmm. and and he inspires you know he inspires me and 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 uh but he's somebody that you know that is my friend you know mm -hmm. and and uh and i think it also goes hand in hand with like you're only as good as like the people you surround yourself with yeah, you know what yeah. i mean another thing that i've been trying to do as well in my life is uh surround myself with the type of people that i want to absorb some good qualities and whatnot so and it goes both ways yeah just so 100%. You, know, you know what i mean yeah i mean yeah i I've, I've definitely got my my flaws you know what i mean i try to i try to work on them i'm not as friendly not not i'm friendly I'm not as uh conversive as people think i am because i have a podcast they think okay he's gonna show up and i'm just gonna whip out and want to talk about you know, all the politics going on right now and I'm a very quiet and shy person. Like even coming here, I'm like, you know what? All right, when you get there, just just tell them what you're gonna do and do it. Because I'm like, all right, well, does you think I'm good? You know, I'm always in my head like that yeah, shit. Yeah, you know what I'm no, saying? Guess, yeah. Same thing with doing photography. I'm like, fuck, I don't want to be everybody's face. You know, one of my favorite photographers is uh is Tim O'Keefe. Oh I've, yeah, he's been a big, 
mentor of mine in this whole journey. And, you know, that's one thing I've always I'm always in my head a lot, overthinking shit. And um, that's just call? natural. I think uh, for yeah. people like us, you know, like, yeah. like more creative type people, you know, it's, uh, um, but yeah, I understand that. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like something, you know, like people do expect you to be, yeah. or you feel like, I mean, maybe, it's, maybe, maybe it's it is getting in, head, in your head, yeah, in yeah. your head. But like people, like, I feel like sometimes, like, I feel like so many aspects of my life has become like, I, and I'll make the joke, and this is just kind of in jest, but, like, I feel like so many aspects of my life is I'm, a like, a PR person, you know? Yeah, yeah. Whether it's for my business or for my motorcycle club or for, you know... Uh, any of the uh, events and stuff you've done over the years. you know, like, yeah. anything I'm involved in, like, you know... Um, it's like you, you feel like you just find yourself, like, going through the motions of, like... Like, you got to be that person that's, like, you know, always, yeah. like... You know, people want to talk to you about something, whatever. And then, the you know, I'll catch myself and be like, man, why am I talking right now? Like, I don't even want to talk. Like, not, yeah. not in this situation, obviously. But, like, you know, like, in the sense of, like, I want to learn something about someone else. You know yeah, what I you mean? Yeah, you want to ask like, the questions more. Yeah, yeah. like, I, I'm, I'm more interested in, in hearing about other people's perspectives and stuff. Yeah. And, like, it's a uh, – so, yeah, there is a lot of a different, you know, it's just things it, that go on like that. It just, I mean, like I said, you, you probably nailed it on the head. It is probably in my head, but I do get in that position where, you know, people will listen to, you know, podcasts and they'll hear me talk for, you know, five years now. And then they'll, hey, man, episode 56, you said this, man. So what do you really think of it? I'm like, bro, I don't even remember who fucking was on episode 56. Like, You're like be a little more and, specific. And I've said, I've used that analogy quite a bit on this podcast, and but it's fucking true. It happens all the time. You know what I mean? Um, or... <laughs> Well, I've always told somebody, like, it's weird being known in the motorcycle industry, right? Because when you, you know, I want to go to campouts and parties and shit, and it's always like somebody treats you like you're more famous than you are, and then the other people go, who the fuck is that guy? Why are you, why are you, you know what I mean? And I've had, I've had literally people come up to me and go, why are you special? Like, just straight call me out, and I'm like, I don't, f who said I was fucking special, you know what I mean? So you get those kind of things, and it's yeah, just yeah. A, a weird dynamic sometimes. Yeah. That I've dealt with, you know what well, I mean? Well, I'm definitely special, but in a different yeah. way, I think. <laughs> um, but, but uh, no, like, it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's always something weird, you know, or, like, like people, I've had people come up and, like, and, and you know, I mean, using the word, using the word famous, like, yeah. like thinking about famous, like, uh yeah, yeah we're I don't not, know any of that goes hand in hand. That's why infamous, I say motorcycle. Infamous, maybe. <laughs> infamous means yeah. like all those things, but you don't make any money. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, like people come, I remember like people for like people coming up to me and like introducing themselves as their like Instagram name, and I'm like, what yeah. the fuck? I'm like, what? It's a common and like, thing. Whenever, yeah. You know, this is you know, I don't know if this still, if, I don't, I can't think of something like that's happened recently. But I'm just like, I'm like, what's your name? How's it yeah. going, man? Like, I'm mad or whatever, or like, you know. But like, you know, there's always gonna be some odd things like that whenever you have, especially this day and age with all the internet stuff, social media yeah. stuff, or whatever, and you have things out there that represent yourself, like yeah. you do with your podcast or whatever. You know, it's uh, you just gotta take it with a grain of salt, right? And yeah. Like, and I, mean, do you, I try to do my best to like normalize it. Not that I, not that I ever have to really deal with that, but like, like if that ever kind of comes up or something like, and uh -huh. people act, if someone acts weird or whatever, it's like, I do my best to normalize the situation. Yeah, like yeah. the way I grew up and the way I was raised, like, like I was taught to, you know, you shake a man's hand, you look him in the eyes and you tell him you introduce yourself and you know, like, yeah. that's just how I've always been my whole life, you know? And like, so when people start, if someone starts acting weird like that, I'm just kind of like, Hey, yeah. what's your name, man? My, I'm Matt, you know, and like, like, you know, and it, uh, it seems to kind of help with the situation. Well, for me at the same time, like I used, when I would see guys like yourself in a magazine, I'd be like, you know, we'd be at a bike event. like, Oh, that's fucking Matt Jackson. I need to go say something to him. And then you walk up and be like, Hey, what's up? <laughs> I don't know what to say, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I probably stood in a circle with you like four or five times in my life. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Cool. Nice bike, bro. Like I just, I, I'm, I lock up all the fucking time. Yeah. For some reason, like on a podcast or whenever people know I'm coming over to do a podcast, I can be in a more natural habitat of like conversation. But normally it's like, and I, I hate myself for doing this all the time, but it's like, I'll see somebody like born free Cal or Texas this year. Saturday, I was sick as a dog. I was in the tent the entire time. We were both in the bowl. Yeah. You, I was yeah, yeah. on opposite ends. 
And uh, the next day I woke up and I had, I had hopes to finally, you know, make a meeting with Billy Lane. Uh, I wanted to come say hi to you, uh, you know, Bare Knuckle Paul. There's a lot of other, a lot of people there I wanted to see, but it was Sunday and everybody's packing up. I walked through and then I like, I didn't know if I had COVID or not. So I didn't want to go like get up in someone's shit and possibly give them and sick be and so whatnot. Be weird about it. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. So it's like, I'm telling everybody, yeah, man. I, yeah. I was sick all day yesterday. And it was like, what do you, got? <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? But you know, it's one of those things, man. It's like I, you know, born free was a good event and I wanted to try to capitalize on some relationships there. And, uh, Spent it in a tent. <laughs> well, there'll always be time, you know. Yeah, yeah. There'll always be time. And and one thing, man, like, you know, uh, I don't know. I always appreciate people that don't have a lot to say. So, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I like to, I, you know, uh, and, you know, some of the people that know me the best are going to, like, kind of, you know, laugh at this or smirk because I do feel like I've, something inside me, and man, it's probably, like, a lot to do with my, my having your own business and stuff yeah. like that. Right. You, you like never stop working and, 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 you know, dealing with, or like just public relations in general is a big yeah. thing, you know, with yeah. your own business. And, and I've, I've, like I said, I've had to get into that mindset. It's not natural for me. Like, yeah. like I'll find myself halfway into it. Like, you know, like just thinking like, what, what am I doing right now? Like, this is not what I feel like doing, right? Like, yeah. this isn't, this isn't me. Like, I like to sit back and listen, man. And I like to, I like to hear what Absorb, people have to yeah. say and like, and, and, and hear different perspectives and, and, uh, and learn like, like, like everything I do in life, man, like every single day, I love learning something new. You know what I yeah. mean? And I don't set out to do that, but like, that's what I like. Like, like that's how I've found the things that I'm passionate about. And, uh, so I can respect somebody that just hangs back and listens, you know, and yeah. doesn't have a lot. To I like say. that more. I mean, I like the vibe of that more. No, no, no expectations. No, uh, no, no uh, pressure kind of situation. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you were really meaning this, but maybe it just brought up a, something that came up in a podcast I did with Yaniv from Power Plant. And he was talking about how he had worked under, I forget the guy's name, but he had worked under, fuck, it's on the tip of my real famous uh, car builder, whatnot, back out there in uh, California. Ah, fuck. Anyway, it'll probably come to me in a second. But he was talking about how he learned all this stuff, all this fabrication, all this metal work, and that for so long they just they they weren't really trying to give out the secrets. They were trying to keep it. But now nobody's asking to learn this shit, really. Or people are, but it's very far and few between that someone's out there trying to become a metal fabricator or a bike builder versus like being a influencer on line and a YouTuber and shit like that, right? Everybody wants a camera now instead of a welder. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Case in point. So it's, uh, you know, when it comes to talking, it's like, what about like sharing whatever you've accumulated knowledge wise or information wise about everything around the sun of motorcycles and, and Dude, building, you know? One thing I've been like extremely adamant about and like, I still don't believe that I have anything that like, like. I haven't seen anything that I've done that it's like worthy enough to like yeah, cool. try to pass to somebody. Right. But like, I've never once hesitated to like answer any questions regarding yeah. anything I do, any techniques, anything like that, because I've been fortunate enough, man, to like to be around some like really, really talented fabricators and like metal workers and, and, uh, um, and like I learned anything I can do now from them. And they yeah. were the same way. And, and I've always had the perspective cause I've ran into people that, that were very like, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to find out my technique or whatever. And maybe it's just the, the type of work that I do or the style that I'm into is yeah. like, you know, something that's been going on since, you know, the, the fifties yeah, and before, you know, yeah. and, and just in general, like, it's like very simple. The things I do are very simple. So it's like, to me, it's like, okay, well maybe, Maybe it's because these things are played out, and I'm not on the like cusp of 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 any kind of technology or 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 new things or whatever. But and that's what I tend to think. But at the same time, it's like I know that uh, I could show like I could show you right now exactly how I make like take yeah. something simple like a sissy bar, right? Yeah. Or whatever work okay. you know. What Odin? Get away from the Odin. Get away from the stuff, dude. <laughs> Come here. Um, and uh, you know like. Like, just making a piece for a bike, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like a fab, right? And, yeah, it's simple, and it's usually, you know, what it's very simplistic stuff, and I hate to even say it's creative, right? But I know I can show you step-by-step step right now how to do it, 
and go through the steps with you, give you the tools, everything. But your end product is not going to come out looking like mine. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and that's not a negative thing whatsoever. It's just, you know, you can be shown exactly how to do something and, and given the same tooling, everything. But the, what your output is, is never going to be exactly the same when something's yeah, handmade. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so to me, when you learn trades and whatnot, like, like, you know, like I spend 95% of my day TIG welding, right? Yeah. Like I'm down to show anybody how to TIG weld. I mean, uh, it's just repetition, you know what I mean? But like all these things that I've learned over time, like I would, I would love to show other people because what's left when you're gone. Yeah. Yeah. hundred you know I mean? percent. Yeah, like, your like, why are you going to, why are you going to try to, why are you going to try to hold on to something or like hide something that shit, the next person that I show it to could like take it and be like, oh, you made this little simple piece of shit bracket or whatever. Oh, well, look, I'm going to make something fucking bitching out of this. Yeah. Thanks for showing me how to do this. And then they make something that's like, you're like, holy fuck, that's fucking badass. You know, like to me that that's so much cooler than like trying to hold on to something or thinking that you're doing something special yeah, that, yeah. uh, that, you know, that no one else can do because believe me, someone else can do it for sure. Yeah. What do you, uh, you know, I guess jumping back towards, you know, your more or less story. Um, I know you worked at a, a Austin Speed Shop for a while, but I think if I recall right in some of the other stuff I've heard from you, you actually busted ass there and worked for free for quite a while to kind of show your worth, if you will, before you got the opportunity to actually be an employee. So what was that like and what was your mindset going through that like? Yeah, I uh, like you had asked, you had said something previously about, you know, me going to school and everything. And I, I went and like got my degree and whatever. And, uh, and I, I took a job. My degree was in um, applied sociology, which ended up being an emphasis on like uh, statistics and data analysis stuff. Yeah. And I've always kind of had a math oriented brain. Okay. Like uh, my mom's a, a, a calculus. She was a calculus teacher and, and wow. algebra and like uh, AP algebra and all, all that stuff. And, um, and so my mind's always, I've always felt like it's more kind of math oriented. And, uh, and so I got a job right out of college doing that kind of thing, you know, and you're sitting at a desk or whatever. And that, yeah. that's what enabled me. Like, like you said, like, you know, when you, it, it's crazy to think back and like, be like, Oh man, I'm going to make $40,000 a year. Right. Mm -hmm. And now I look back and I'm like, shit, I probably don't even make $40,000 a year now, but, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> exactly. like it's, it, but you, at the time I remember thinking like, Oh, so much money, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to get a motorcycle. That's the first thing I, I, yeah. I went and got, you know, and, uh, and, and, but that's when I got like super into that. And then it's like every day I'm spending like buying motorcycle parts, looking yeah. up, you know, looking at, like, I just got so into it. And then at some point I was like, I had been sitting and my job was, you know, I had a 401k and yeah. insurance and everything. And, uh, and, but I remember sitting at my like desk at my job or whatever. And mind you, I would come in and like, uh, I had like hand tattoos and whatever. And like, I was still playing in bands and stuff. Yeah. And, um, and I, uh, I just remember sitting there thinking like, God, this sucks. Like I need to find something like more meaningful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, and I, and I struggled with that for a little bit. And like, until, um, I had seen that there was a job opening at the Austin speed shop. It was like a management position, like assistant manager or something. And so I went and I, I rode my panhead chopper down there at the time. And, uh, and had an interview with them and, um, you know, I had never done any kind of fabrication. The only mechanic work I had done is on my own bike yeah. or the only fab work I, you know, it helped my buddy and I made my sissy bar and stuff like just little stuff like that. And, uh, but I knew that that was something I was interested in. And I, and I knew the, you know, like I could do like Excel spreadsheets and just yeah, bullshit yeah. like that or whatever. Right. And so I went and interviewed there and they really liked me or whatever. And, but they didn't have a position for me there. Mm -hmm. And, I talked to them and I just kind of hit it off with those guys. And, and I asked, uh, they were like, well, you know, if you want to, a lot of people start here by like interning or whatever, or like, you know, mm -hmm. there was a handful of guys that were turned out to be some of the best fabricators yeah. I've ever met in my life, man, that started off just sweeping the floor there, yeah, you know, and yeah. just being around everything and, and, and getting into it. And, and at that time, like, that's what I wanted to do. So I, uh, I worked there for like four months or something. Um, I would work after hours, like I would work my job, my, my day job and go in at like seven to three or something like that. And then I'd work 
you know, three thirty to to seven or something yeah. at the speed shop um, for free. Mm. And I did that every day for months. Was it like a fucking rush crash course for knowledge on like everything that you've kind of started doing now or no at the time like like that would be after hours actually yeah. so i would i would go in and like do the things that i was like capable of doing or whatever at the time or whatever they needed help with and that was for free you know yeah and then and then after hours that's when i was so i, I kind of i busted my ass and would go there and i and it, it was at the time it was such a, a tight-knit little like group of people we had there yeah some of the most talented people i've ever met in my life man and it's so cool to see every one of them and where they've gone yeah. now because everybody is doing their thing like successfully and has made a name for themselves to an extent and and are just seriously some of the most talented people yeah. i've ever met but we were so close and tight-knit like if you tried to get a job there at the time like Everybody, you know, if you, if they, if they, if one person got a weird vibe from you, it was like, no, hell yeah. no. You know, like it was such a tight a good little, dynamic little to family, have, though. you know, yeah. and, uh, and everybody had their thing, you know, and, uh, and everybody kind of, you know, bounced things off of each other and learned from each other. Uh, you know, like, uh, uh, Patrick Tilbury, uh, was a welder there at the yeah. time, like, and he is working there at the time. And he's one of the people that, that, um, you know, was teaching me to TIG weld and giving me tips and like, and he's still to this day probably yeah, the the most the phenomenal welder i've ever met in my life or seen yeah. you know and uh and and just an all-around great guy too like and so i ended up after after working for free for those months or whatever like i made my spot there right yeah and they hired me on and they matched my salary and everything right nice. and uh and so from there that was working though at like more of an assistant manager kind of position yeah and uh and from there you know, I'd work my 40 hours a week or whatever, my eight hours a day or whatever. And then at the end of the day, the first thing I do is go into the shop mm -hmm. and they let me, you know, yeah. mess with one of the welders and, and start TIG welding, you know? Nice. So I go in there every single day and practice TIG welding, practice using, you know, the bandsaw and like all these fabrication tooling that I had never had access to. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just like getting that hands-on experience with it and learning what works and what doesn't. I wish more people looked at it that way because that's that's a similar way of how I came into this because I, I got a job doing the most basic porter type stuff at a, at a paint shop that did all the stuff for Rick Fairless and everything. And I was so in love with the idea of doing this that I didn't want to leave every day. And then I would he worked seven days a week, so I would come in on the weekends and just hang out because I just wanted to be around it. I felt like being around all the, the, the stuff that was going on, all the motorcycle-related shit, I was just absorbing it and... And even if I wasn't physically, you know, getting paid to be there, I was around it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just being, having that hands-on experience. Even if you're not hands-on, hands-on. But it being right there, right? Watching. And you're you know. seeing how a process works. Like, I catch, I have to catch myself now, man. Like, because I'll see something like, you know, like something I've done recently is, uh, you know, I'll see like a knife somebody made, right? And my, my instant, like, response is I break it down, right? And I'm yeah. like. Okay, how did they go about that? Yeah. I could fucking do this. Yeah. And then I start, then I, then I get fixated on it, right? Yeah. Same thing with leather work, stuff like that. Like, I'll see something, and I'm like, oh, they did this, they did this, they did this. And I start breaking the process down, and I'm like, well, that seems like fun. I can do that, right? Yeah. And then I get fixated on it, and I, like, catch myself, like, you know, I have a little forge now and stuff, and I've, like, I've made a couple of knives, and, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm making a knife, and I'm like, wait, I need to be working on a bike. What the yeah. fuck am I doing? <laughs> you know? Like, I have to, like, tell myself, like, stop, right? Stop. But there's that, there's that, um, I don't know, like that, it's so fulfilling to me yeah. to like create something yourself, right? Yeah, 100%. And, uh, and especially when you're, when you're done with the finished product and you know, it may take months, it may take fucking years or whatever to get something that, that you're proud of. And, uh, but when you're done with it, you're like, dude, I did that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. When you could go and buy it from the store or something. Right. But like you, you look at it and you're like, I fucking handmade that. Like, that's pretty bitching. So I get excited about that stuff. I don't know. I say, man, like I, I got, uh, I did a podcast with Nick knives made by Nick one day. And the next day uh, later on that night, I'm on fucking uh, YouTube looking up how to make knives. I'm like, I could, I could do that. And I was, I'm already in, I already have so many other hobbies or like not necessarily other hobbies, but I just have my hands in so much shit right now. The last thing I do is, take on another trade yeah you know but i guess what i was kind of alluding to is just the concept of if more people you know it, it, you can get a free education 
with just your time. So if you have the time, you can Even use if you it. Don't. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, at the same time, you know, it's like the older you get, the less time you have, but For the sure. more perspective you have. And yeah, it's, if a, you, it's a matter of what you want to do, right? Yeah. Like the thing that I've seen the most is, uh, and I don't know if it's like, if it comes with, um, you know, like, like, like the instant gratification kind of yeah. idea of things. I don't know. I don't like to play into all that stuff. Like, I feel like if somebody's into something and they're passionate about it, like, like, uh, like, like Robert, for instance, that works here, like he, he came up to me at a show and, uh, you know, started talking to me about the bikes and stuff like that. And, and he was like, man, I just moved to, uh, San Antonio, which was still 45 minutes away from yeah. me, you know? And he's like, but, um, I don't know if you ever take on like any like interns or if you, you just need somebody, to, you know, organize stuff or like sweep the floor or whatever. He's like, I'd love to, I want to be around motorcycles. That's what I want to do. You know? And yeah. I said, and I, and, and I say the same thing to every person that like comes up and says something to me like that, or sends me a message on yeah, the internet or yeah. whatever. I say the same thing. I say, sure. We always looking for people like, or whatever, or like, I, I just like, I'm open about, it. I'm like, just come hang out, like come to the shop, check it out. Yeah. You know how many people follow up on that? Like Robert same. is one of them. Yeah. Uh, um, our good friend Isai that, that works here with us, he, uh, he's probably the only other, one of the only other people or, and, and Jake that was just here, like the guys that are here right now are like three out of maybe literally probably like 50 people that have like hit me up like that. Right. Yeah. But I just tell them all the same thing. I'm like, Hey, well, yeah, if you, if you're interested in that, like come by the shop. Yep. Well, and it's just funny. Like, it's not funny. It's just interesting to me. The the people that don't take that next step. Yeah. Like it's something that they're interested in for whatever reason, you know, I get it. Like, like, you know, I, I mean, when I go into different situations and stuff, I'm, I'm, you know, I get anxiety about it and I get, mm. you know, nervous about things or whatever, but like, it's just interesting to see the people that follow up and really want to do it. Right. And like, those are the guys that are here with me, working with me. It's almost like you're calling their bluff. Like, yeah. they're like saying, yeah, I want to come up there and expect you to go. And like, nah, we don't do that, you know, but then you're yeah. like, yeah, man, come on up. And they're like, fuck, like, I don't know if I was ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? So, yeah. But I mean, and you, and you don't have to be. It's just a matter of like, like, fuck, at most days, I don't think I'm ready. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, it's a, it's just a matter of, and that, and that's the thing is like, a, you learn so much more just being around like-minded people yeah. and, and absorbing the information and, and seeing the things firsthand. Like when you get to come into the shop, like you get to see, okay, well, you know, Oh yeah, Matt has made a sissy bar or whatever, right? But you you're not like you don't know the step by step process, right? But when you're in the shop and like lending a hand and like you know uh, making bungs or something for the sissy bar, like you got you know a hands on kind of thing, mm -hmm. like then you're able to see the process start to finish. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, and that's where you learn things. And that to me that's a that's a fun part. So while you were working at uh, Austin Speed Shop, like what you know doing your normal job there, but were the skills that you were acquiring because you wanted to translate into motorcycles or were you kind of open-minded to doing like also hot rods and things like that as well? Or, I mean, I don't know if I'd say I was open-minded about it. Like the fabrication things that I was learning were mostly, you know, based off of the car cause it was all cars there, yeah. you know? But I mean, everything, once I got my first motorcycle and even before that, like everything in my life was centered around motorcycles, you know, yeah. like I didn't want to do anything that didn't have to do with motorcycles. And now fast forward, uh, that's my life 24 hours a yeah, day. And you're kind of like, fuck, I hate motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've never no. felt that way. But, <laughs> but yeah, once you make it your life, you're like, damn it. Well, here I go. But yeah, I, I I was definitely open to utilizing, like learning those skills. And, and I knew that if I could apply them to a car, which I've never really liked cars. Yeah. Um, uh, even a lot of the bitch and stuff that we worked on there and whatnot, like it just never was my thing, you know, yeah. like, and uh, it, uh, it was always motorcycles. Same. All the time. Yeah. I just, I, I mean, I could appreciate a really nice car or a badass like C10 or lots of different things like that, but I just don't. I don't know if it's because it takes too long to do one and I need to see a project through quicker, if that makes sense. Um, I just don't think I could be interested in one project that could take me two or three years to do. That's, that's definitely one of the aspects. I mean, when you're, when you're dealing with a motorcycle, like, like uh, you know, it, it definitely is not as long of a process. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just a whole different – to me, it was a whole different vibe. Like – it was like a whole different world, you know what I mean? Like, and 
it was interesting when those worlds collided because yeah. like like uh you know being when i was at the speed shop uh we had was it the first the first giddy up i think we had the pre-party at the speed shop mm. no it might have been the second I, yeah i think it was the second i built a generator shovel that we yeah. gave away and uh we had a uh, uh, a pre-party at the speed shop and uh and it's interesting to see those two worlds kind of collide, you know, mm. because in, in theory you feel like they're the same kind of, it's the same kind of thing, but car people are way different than motorcycle yeah. people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I never really related with the car people, even though I have a lot of good friends to this day that are, are, you know, only into cars and not bikes. Right. But like, there's something, man, there's something about like, I mean, once you, and, and not, not to say that riding an old chopper or something is, is any better or or more significant than you know riding any other type of bike but once you get on a a foot clutch jockey shift you know panhead chopper yeah and ride it through you know city traffic or something like you're not really in tune with the world until you're doing that yeah. you know what i mean like your senses are in tune you are you're like i'm about to die you're you know what i mean in. and like yeah. everything is like it, it's it's there's no other feeling like it you know what i mean like uh-huh. you you there's no zoning out. There's no, you know, yeah. there's no putting your bike on cruise control and like, you know, taking a nap head, yeah. with your, with your drink holder or whatever the fuck, you know, like you're <laughs> looking at every intersection, like who's about to hit me. Yeah. Am I about to stall in the middle of this damn intersection? How do you, you need know to what approach I mean? like, this intersection? Yeah. You know? Oh, I'm coming up to a hill. I got to do a little dance and uh, make sure I don't stall the bike in front yeah. of everybody. And gotta then start to cool kick still. it, you know, <laughs> yell at my chick to get off the bike before I have to put the kickstand down and start kicking it in the middle of an intersection, you know, like, <laughs> All those fun things, but it definitely puts you way more in tune, you know, but I, I've just, I don't know. I've just always been more drawn to the, to the bike culture. Yeah. I, I, I'm the same, man. I, I did the, I was into, I was into like import cars originally, you know, cause similarly what you said about like your thing about, uh, you know, having the, the job in the statistics and things like that. Uh, is that what it was? Statistics. Yeah. 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 Um, I, went, I came out of high school and went into architecture. So I was sitting in an architectural firm, like, getting paid, but, like, minimum wage while I was going to school for architecture. So I was doing basic draftsman stuff, and I was fucking bored out of my mind. You know, like, I was like, the concept of designing an arch- architecture was there, but I was never going to be there. That's, like, 10 years of school. You got to get a master's degree and shit like that. Like, I wasn't planning on doing that. And then I, was, then I found out that, like, it ain't even – if you do become a full blown architect, you're not really designing shit. You know, the money's not in that because you're just laying it all out. You're just like taking a, a set of plans from a motel six and they're making, you're making them work within this County that you're in because Mm -hmm. you know, all the ADA stuff and all this shit. Right. So it just kind of unveiled the curtain. It's like, man, this is not the creative outlet that I thought I was going to have. And then the Fast and the Furious came out, and I was like, that's fucking rad. And I can afford those kind of cars. Yeah, for sure. You know, I couldn't get a, you know, Mustang or those, you know, or old school, like, V8 shit. So Yeah. But there's a rush from driving a, a manual transmission. Yeah, you know? manual, yeah. yeah. And, um, man, I got hooked onto that shit, like racing, street racing, uh, making shit fast. So we used to build a lot of turbo motors back in the day, and then I just racked up so many fucking tickets and <laughs> no insurance tickets and the, the bikes kind of saved me from that world. And then I just kind of translated all that, that love for like creating and, and living on the edge, if you will, yeah, yeah. into, uh, no, it's a rush, you know, into it's- the motorcycles. And, uh, man, it was every once in a while I see an old car. I'm like, fuck, I remember that those days. It was rad running from the cops, shit like that in the cars and everything. Yeah. But then we just did it on sport bikes for a couple of years. And yeah, so then I, you can I'm, really get away. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, it's just, um, it's just different, man. It's like, I know what you mean. The car thing just doesn't speak to me the way motorcycles had, did. And and honestly, it wasn't until I really started traveling on bikes that it really just, like, finally seeped all the way to the core of me and had a full hold on me. Like, I, there's no way I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I think that's what really determines, uh, like, the the everyday person that's into motorcycles versus, like, someone who really makes it their life, man. It's like, is because, uh, I mean, I love doing this for a living and stuff. And I, yeah. I love... I mean, I love having my business and, and getting to be around such cool bikes and, and, and create things and whatnot. But you know what I love more than that? I love riding motorcycles, yeah. you know? And, I, and, and it's easy to lose sight of that. Very, very. And, uh, 
and that's that's where like in my life like I've gone other routes in order to ensure that yeah the I get to ride in. motorcycles. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like I put myself in a place where I'm like I'm gonna put miles down. You know what I mean? And yeah. like that's that's what that's what I love. That's what I enjoy. Yeah. I love creating things and making something cool or whatever. And bikes can look cool and stuff, but like. More than anything, I love getting on a motorcycle and just riding. You know, that's the only time in my life that I feel like I uh, I can think. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, I don't hook up my phone. I don't have a little Britney Spears microphone and shit, yeah. you know, like, so I can take a phone call or whatever. Yeah. Like, I, uh, I, like, that's the only time where I can, like, get away, you know, and, like, actually process things going on. Yeah. No, I know what you mean, man. It's a, it's a, it's a unique spot, man. I think uh, I've heard it said through generations, but like you know, what they say like the first fifty miles you're dealing with today's problems, the next hundred you're dealing with last week's problems, and as you keep going on the mileage, you 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 assess all the shit in your life you need to assess, and then you're free finally after about two or three hundred miles. You're like, I've never heard that, but I like that a lot. Now I'm yeah. now everything has been worked out in my head, uh, you know. I, I know where I'm at. I know what I want to do. You know, I've always told people, like, I, I'll go on a road trip and think of five business plans <laughs> that I want to do this when I get back. And then you get so stoked. And it also, it, honestly, it helps you kind of keep going down the road. Like, you got, you know, you got a 1,000-mile day ahead of you or 500, whatever the case may be. It's like those places you go in your head, even though you're still plugged into the road and the smells yeah. and the feels and stuff, it just kind of – that's a place I can't get to in my car. I can't get to it while I'm work. It's, Definitely it's a type of meditation, if yeah, you will. No, you know sure. what I mean? So, no, it's yeah. It's a. Uh, I mean, like, you know, as as uh, as cheesy as it sounds, it's a definitely a type of of therapy, right? And yeah. God knows we need a lot of that, probably. Dude, I never thought we did, man. But nowadays, it feels <laughs> like it, it's a necessity, and it feels yeah. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. I hate saying shit like that because, like, talking about like. <laughs> Well, you know, my mental health and all this. It's like, I don't... Oh, yeah. I don't my mental like say, health fucked, probably, dude. Pre, I'm, I think that we're, we all are. I just don't think that we've ever... I, I told my wife this. I was like, I didn't know what depression and anxiety was until I met you and you explained it to me. <laughs> and I realized that I had... I never really had depression, but I definitely have anxiety all the time. Everybody you know has I mean? anxiety, man. So, and like, I mean, and I know people have it in different, like, in varying degrees yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I know I'm in the same boat, man. Like, uh, but you know, that, that's how we work things out. You know, we have these things that, I mean, that's seriously the, the, like I said, like, that's the only time I can really think, you know, like I can't, I'm not reading my text messages. I'm not, uh, worried about, you know, a customer texting me about something. Yeah. I'm not worried about a phone call or whatever. Like I'm, I know where I'm writing to, I'm writing there and it gives you that time to, to really process and think through things and then you know when you go on a 2500 mile ride or something it's like you know you you come out of it with with good stuff you know it's it, it helps yeah and lot. i mean i mean you you could probably say this to to all the traveling you've done through the band stuff and now with the motorcycle stuff as well it's like i don't know about you but i love traveling i love traveling motorcycle related going to connect with people in their part of the country it's almost like you're you, you're exploring, but you have a, the the best the best tour guide possible for, for these sure. these cities or these places that you're going to because they know the best bars, they know the best restaurants, they know the spots to stay away from, and it's just uh, and you all have that common thing. Yeah, you're all and you're just stoked to be around each other because you probably hadn't seen each other in months or whatever. So that dynamic is like a it's a high that I lo I love chasing. You know what I'm saying? No, for sure, and it's that all goes hand in hand with with learning. You know, like like learning, you know new perspectives yeah on life on anything you know like that's the things i get excited about you know yeah. like I, I love to hear people's perspective it could be people that i don't agree with you know like yeah. in, in in anything in my life or whatever or what you know but but uh one thing i've learned over my life is i've learned more about what not to do from people yeah. And I have, like, been taught things of what to do, you know? So I feel like there's always something you can take from experience and whatnot. And, yeah. yeah, getting to travel all over, riding motorcycles all over, experiencing different terrains, experiencing, you know, like, uh, you know, just it, every place has a different culture. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and, you know, you do your best to take all the positive aspects yeah. from that 
and employ them in, in your own life, you know, and that, that, uh, I think that just makes you a more well-rounded and better person. hundred percent. Yeah. Traveling definitely did that for me. And that's one thing I try to, with my kids, I try to implement doing traveling as well, but doing road trips. That way you see what, what's in between the big places. Right. And that's what makes up this whole country is that the part you're driving through, you know what I mean? Those little towns, uh, that's how things connected across this country when it started. And, and, you know, like, to appreciate New York, you got to appreciate all the stops on the way there instead of just the, the two and a half hour ride. Flight, yeah. here, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's cool, man. So like you had mentioned a while ago about, you know, the concept of well, you were still working at, uh, you know, Austin Speed Shop whenever the whole concept of Giddy Up came along. What and from what from your perspective, what was kind of like the thing that made you guys want to do Giddy Up in the first place? Well, I mean, at that point, um most of us have been out to born free. Uh, I gone out to the second born free yeah. and then the third. And, uh, was the second one, the one they did at the block party? Yes. In Long Beach. Oh, yeah, that I was I the first one I went that. out to, yeah. man. That, that was, that was such a cool experience for me. Cause like I had, like I had been to California. I'd been to Long Beach yeah. on tour and stuff, but when you're touring a band, it's like, you never get to see anything. Like yeah. literally, I mean, we toured Europe and stuff and I couldn't tell you, shit from that you know <laughs> like like you're literally going from venue to venue yeah you know and like and and it's always an ordeal and whatever right so i remember uh yeah that that year uh my buddy nick and i loaded up he had a he had a uh triumph chopper that he built and then i had this uh it was a 72 1972 uh shovel head chopper and we just put them in the back of my truck that I had at the time, and we drove straight out to California, nice. you know, um, and dropped the bikes down. We got some – We it never occurred to us. I remember looking back now and thinking how ridiculous this is, but we got out there, and we were like, oh, because we were just like, well, we're camp somewhere. Yeah. We're, we're in fucking Long Beach. You know? There's no way we could camp in Long Beach, right? Yeah. And so you we can camp quickly, there, but it's under a bridge or yeah, something. Yeah, right, exactly. And, uh, and so – we quickly figured out, we're like, shit, we need to get a hotel or something. So we, we like, you know, put our money together, got a hotel. And, uh, you know, we just kind of did it on a whim. And uh, and actually that was, uh, yeah, that year, that's when I first met uh, Jeremiah from Love Cycles. Like nice. we stopped at his shop. Uh -huh. His shop was real small in, in Phoenix. And uh, and um, I met my, my good friend Brian Langner there, um, who Jeremiah just built a bike for. And, uh, and I think, you know, actually it was the next year that he built the, I think the next year that he built the Dave Mann, like yeah. painted tank and stuff. But, um, you know, like just going out there, getting to meet people like that. And, and, um, we got there in Long Beach and like I said, we, we were like, oh, we thought we were going to camp and we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. So we get a hotel room or whatever, motel room. And, uh, and just, you know, pulled our bikes down and just, I remember just riding around Long Beach mm -hmm. and, you know, it was probably June you know, is when the, bike, the show typically is, but like, it felt so, I mean, it, it felt so good just riding a chopper yeah. around out there and like, it was cool. It was just a different, you know, it was a different yeah, vibe, different yeah. feeling. And then going to, to that show and it being like a block party and just seeing all these bikes that like I had seen in like magazines, stuff like that. And like, you know, like. Uh, one of Mark Drew's bikes and like, you know, just, I, I was just enamored with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I couldn't believe it. And um, so that was a big influence on us yeah. to do Giddy Up. And, and we liked that vibe, like, especially the second year of Born Free, you know, like just, just creating something that was a party, yeah you know, and yeah. like um, all of us that were putting on Giddy Up, you know, we we're all from Texas. Like, you know, we wanted it to have a real Texas feel to it. Odin, hey, what are you doing, dude? Get away from the cables. Come here. What are you doing? Come here, bud. Um, but, uh, you know, like, we wanted it to feel like a, like a, like just a Texas party, you know? Like, yeah. a, just a, you know. And, yeah, we had a, we had a real good time with it. But so that, that was a big inspiration for it, you know? The, like, the first Giddy Up, was it more like, uh, you know, did y'all, did y'all do it at the same location, like the River Road Ice House yes. situation? Yeah. When did the camping aspect come into play? That first that year. That first year? Yeah. All right, so <laughs> that became its own thing. Huh? 100%. I did my best to stay. stay. I, it's funny to think about it now, but like I did my best to steer clear of there. Yeah. You know, like uh, like Joey Joey Cano, like 
he was one of uh, one of the uh, organizers of the show with me. Yeah. And he and I've been like good good friends since we were eighteen, so we've known each other for a long time. And uh, and still is you know he's one of my best friends to date and yeah. has had such a major impact on like not only influential in terms of me building bikes, but like, uh, you know, I, I, he ends up doing a lot of paint work and stuff on, yeah. on my bike builds. And, um, and it's just become like, you know, uh, it's just really cool to have him be a part of a lot of that yeah. stuff. So, so when he, you know, he would, he loved going down to the campsite and stuff like that. So like he would handle that for me <laughs> in that aspect, but I only went down there a few years is what's yeah. funny. I tried to steer clear. I think uh, <laughs> so. My first year at Giddy Up was uh, 2017. So it was a year after I fell in love with all this culture, right? Um, 2017, I, I met a guy because I bought my first FXR that literally uh, six years ago yesterday was my first FXR that I had done and, and customized. And uh, my friend FXR Mike, I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yeah, yeah. He's the one that got me in that, and he told me about Giddy Up. He's like, "You want to? You should go to Giddy Up. It's it's so and so." I was like, "What the fuck is what the fuck is a Giddy Up?" You know what I'm saying? So, I go down there nonchalantly, never really camped before. I'm from the city; it just didn't really happen much for us. And I go down there and I camp with some guys. I end up hooking up with some guys from Houston. They were there. We all went a day early, like Thursday or some shit. And I swear to God, that shit changed my life because. The show was rad. The show was rad. It had all the all the cool shit you want to see. Um, it had a great vibe. But that campsite was something I never experienced in motorcycling as an adult. It was the most inviting. And everybody that I've known that's been there from California, they would say, like, man, we just walked up into their campsite, and they're just throwing us beers, and, hey, where are you from? And it's like that's when I really started to learn, like, what it meant to have, host like, be a Texas hospitality and that kind of concept, right? I've heard of it growing up, but I, I, I saw it for the first time, and I understand. I saw it in my own. It's kind of like when you go to church and you hear the sermon, but until it relates to you, you don't really absorb it at all, if yeah, you will. Sure. And that, so it, it, it happened there. And I had so much fun and riding those roads, um, being around all those bikes, and uh, just the whole New Bronzeville vi vibe was just amazing. And to this day, I mean – our camp out that is now going on its sixth year is a child of that experience. That's awesome. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? That's cool. Man. So my first born free was two months after Giddy Up, and I was like, "What the fuck? This ain't nothing like Giddy Up." That yeah. I went with Giddy Up goggles on. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Expecting it to have a camping vibe and and a little bit more of that southern hospitality that we we have here, and it didn't. And it's taken me years to finally love born free for what born free is for sure you know what i mean yeah when you have that perspective or that idea of it going into yeah. it yeah i mean uh yeah i mean and i'd like to say that all that stuff was planned with giddy up or whatever yeah, but like yeah. it, it it was really just a culmination of all of us involved with it that were putting it on and then all the other factors as far as location yeah. um you know everybody else we brought in with it the the campsite and and man it, it just it really created something cool, yeah. and and it's it's cool to hear something like that. We still actually uh, every year around the town we still go back to the campsite. I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> there's cool. there's a couple of us that go out. Like I, me and my wife go out, and then there's some guys from Houston, and and it's just a great vibe down there, man. Yeah, that cool. time of year too. You so know? beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It really showcases like to me it was something cool because. Even the first year, you know, we had friends come down from Minnesota yeah. and Michigan and stuff like that and bring bikes, and they were, like, shoveling snow to get out of their <laughs> places, and then they get down to, to New Braunfels, and it's like, they're like, what the fuck is this, yeah, you know? Like, yeah. this is beautiful. And people who haven't experienced riding in Texas and stuff like that, like, Texas is such a big place that, like, instantly your mind goes to, like, you know, Flatlands or, like, like Amarillo or, like, or, or West yeah. Texas or whatever, right, where people have gone through and stuff or, yeah. or El Paso. But, like, people don't realize, like, right there in the hill country, just, like, what a, uh, you know, like, what a beautiful place it is. And and and, um, and that really lent to, to making yeah, the show it. successful and, and what it was. A lot of the badass roads in Texas, like, they're not on the highways that you travel through. Like, when you're going through Colorado and you're on 70, like, you go through some amazing shit. Yeah. You know, I, and same thing on 40 going through, like, Nat Asheville and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, sure. So it's like you really see what they, what they have to offer because the main major highways, like, take you almost on a scenic route. And Texas, it doesn't. It's off the highways, you know, after you get about 50 miles off the highway that you find some cool shit. So, yeah. 
same thing. Like I, I did Terralingua for the first time ever this year, and uh, for the FXRs of Houston, they do the run out there. Yeah, dude, I'm fucking hooked. That place is amazing. I've never been there before. And yeah. I was like, and it's and it's such a. I mean, yeah, there's such a diverse uh, landscape in Texas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not only the size of the place, but like, I mean, it, it, every like, yeah. There's just like a lot of diversity as far as, I mean, you go out there and it's like yeah all those hills and mountains and stuff you know like and like it's just windy roads and it's beautiful yep. right and then you know then then you know you get on i-10 and you ride flat all the way through <laughs> el paso or whatever right <laughs> out there but like and then you know th- then you get to the hill country and you have like the you know the uh, three sisters stuff like that like yeah. all these uh, i mean there's all these like hidden or and then we're born free texas was like yeah you get out there behind the pine curtain and stuff and like you get all the with the pine trees and like it's fucking beautiful out there it is like there's just so many different aspects to it and a lot of diversity it's pretty cool yeah it's i think you just gotta like seek it more you know it's not i think it's earned a little bit more here than it is in like you know your california and your your tennessees and well yeah you take the pch or whatever in california right it's it's beautiful yeah. You know, and you go through the redwoods and stuff up there, and like you know, like like for us, it's like, oh yeah, you want to take thirty five all the way through Salina, Kansas, to <laughs> through Nebraska to yeah. uh, Rapid City because I've done that ride several times, and it's just straight thirty five, yeah. man. You can and almost it's see rough, the end, dude. And then and then, but then you take the other route and you go through Raton Pass and stuff, yeah. and it's like, holy shit, this is fucking so beautiful. much better. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, man. So like you know, I I, I feel like. You kind of said something that I can relate to on that situation. It's like you just kind of created it, and then it took on its own life. It became its own thing for everybody that came to it, kind of like art. Like art is something you put out there, and then it's interpreted different ways by everybody, right? And the same thing happened with our camp out. You know what I mean? It, it just It's become different for a lot of different people and how they, they use it or they – where the, how they place it in their world and whatnot. And uh, I've just always wanted to be able to say that to you, that I appreciate what y'all did. And even though it's not here anymore, it's still, I in, in a way, I'm when I say I'm glad it's not, it's not because I'm glad it's not. It, I wish it was still here. But it's badass to have something that you can, like, remember and say that you got to experience it. Yeah, you know and what I mean? so fondly like that, and and to hear, and that's really cool to hear, man. Like that, yeah. that um, you know, like it's stuff like that that really makes it all worth it. Because I remember looking back and just like you know it being over with, and and thinking like like I'm worn the fuck out, you yeah. know, and like we we never really made much money, but there was a couple of times where you know you'd walk away with some cash or whatever, and you're like, watch out, Odin, uh, uh, Odin, get your ass over here. Here, let me let him off the leash. <laughs> they got lunch, so he's uh Oh yeah, he's like, hey, I smell that. <laughs> I'm gonna go shake him down. <laughs> um But yeah, that that kind of thing, like, man, I can't tell you how many times like I'd be worn the fuck out after the show, right? Yeah. And like we all would be, and it's like, fuck, this was so much work, you know? And like, especially the couple of years, a couple of years I built a bike to give away and stuff. It's like, man, yeah, there's so much pain, pressure yeah. for it. And it was just like, oh, it was like you were just drained when it was done, right? And then to hear something like that and, like, hear stories like that, which I have several times, and and, and to see how much, you know, people enjoyed it and how appreciative people are, and uh, that really makes it all worth it. That's what yeah. I always said afterwards, man. Like, when, I mean, there was one year that, uh, you know, like, I mean, several years, but there was, uh, you know, people that, came from Sweden and people that came from England and like, and then they like, you know, they enjoyed it so much. And then they would like, you know, I'd randomly run into one of them on like Congress or something afterwards. Right. Like the, like a day after that they stayed in town and stuff and to hear them like tell me that they came from Sweden and, and how much they enjoyed it and like how they can't wait to come to it next year. It's like, that's where you're just like, I mean, I like got goosebumps thinking about it because it's, you're like, damn, I fucking, was part of something that that really made an impact like that and and yeah. and, and people had a good time and what more could you ask for with that exactly you know, like i mean it was it, it was such a good thing and uh but it, for for someone like me who's been in the motorcycle industry and somewhat seen for for you know a long time it was just a breath of fresh air from your your daytonas and your sturgises and you know 
street vibes and all these other more larger commercialized events, n- those are still fun. Don't get me wrong. Like those have a place and they're, I'm a, I'm a forever, every year Sturgis guy. You know what I mean? Uh, not so much Daytona, but every year Sturgis for sure. And um, to have something like that to get your fix of like the big conglomerate motorcycle thing, right? The big high school reunion, if you will, versus like the smaller, more intimate events, even though Giddy Up wasn't small, it was still thousands of people. Yeah, it was compared still, to yeah. seventy thousand people, like yeah. you could find this you could find more like you in a in a place like Giddy Up or a place like Daytona or a, a Run to Raton or these other smaller yeah, yeah. events, you know what I'm saying? You, you, know, mil- you know. You know what I thought was really cool and, and uh and I've looked back on is um an aspect that I thought we really were able to bring to the show that most people weren't in tune with and, and especially a lot of people coming from out of state and stuff yeah was being at the show everybody got along everybody had a good time you had all walks of life man and then you had a lot of like motorcycle club members and stuff there yeah. of different motorcycle clubs and and but i felt like because of all those different aspects that we brought to the table with it and it gave people an opportunity to see people in a different light. You know what I mean? Like you get like, uh, you know, like, like everybody thinks that whatever, everybody have a perception of something like when it comes to a motorcycle club member or something, somebody wearing a patch or whatever. Right. Yeah. And then like, that was one of the things I really enjoyed about Gideon was everybody was just in the mix together, man, having a good time. And I got a, I got a vague theory on that because I noticed that too. You know what I mean? Is it like, I think that we're more appreciative here for those kind of events because, and I think a lot of more the club world here is more respecting the fact that we have these things as opposed to, and like I said, this isn't like a dig at any, any side, but California has a lot of that type of shit. And so, and then a lot more club presence, just like, I imagine a lot more club presence and they just kind of have more shit going on. And they have another show, like, oh, we'll blow this one out of the water, like, cause it, cause a scene, and then we still got that show down there, right? And here it just felt like everybody was like, look, don't fuck this up. Don't yeah. fuck this up for anybody. And on, and on top of that, it's like everybody here, man, like, you know why we have motorcycle clubs? It's because we love motorcycles. Yeah. You know, like, and, and, and that's the thing that brings everybody together, you know. Yeah. And we, we love motorcycles. You know, we love having a good time. And, uh, and, you know, just being amongst like-minded people. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, there's always that aspect of, like, don't fuck this shit up, right? Yeah. But that's just a respectful thing, you know what I mean? Like, that's just a respect because, like, you got to give respect to get respect. Exactly. You know? So I, I, thought, I thought that really lent to, uh, I don't know, I thought that was a really cool aspect of the show because I remember, like, different companies coming down and being a part of it and having a vendor booth and stuff, and then afterwards being, like, this is so much fun. Like, this is so crazy, man. Like I'm walking around with, you know, like one percenters over here. Like then, you know, like there's like, you know, these like, you know, hipster, like whatever, like (laughs) kids and like, you know, but everybody's into the same stuff and having a good time. Everybody just wants to have fun, you know? And so that's why we really prided ourselves on, on just having a Texas party. And it was, you know, I I felt like it just, yeah, it was something special. It was cool. But yeah, for sure. I'm glad you had a good time with it, man. Oh, That's man, cool. thank you for, for what you and all, all the other guys did with that for us, or at least myself. I know a lot of my friends got to experience it the last year, um, which it only got better every year. I remember one year, uh, Oliver, uh, one of my favorite chopper builders, Oliver, came to town, and uh, he, he stayed at our campsite with us. And uh, another homie from from uh, California, uh, Joe Kidd, FXR guru. Yeah. Just, I don't want to tell their stories on here, but they both had these stories about how they were just trying to get out and do some things that night. And it was just every night we sat around a campfire and we heard stories from the night before that we were just looking that way and it took place right there kind yeah. of situations. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's cool. such a, I was, you know, I don't know. I like to bring people together. That's something that I've always liked doing myself. And, you know, I remember I would be the, the, the one like trying to put together, like get there early to get our spot at the campsite and then make sure that we had enough space for all the people that were coming. And I was always proud of like, fuck man, like I'm sitting at a fire, like kind of what you were saying about like, uh, you know, when the people you idolize become your friends and, uh, you know, it was just rad to sit there and, and think like, man, I, I'm, I feel so honored that 
this guy who's a master at certain things, or at least in my eyes, a master at is like fucking wants to sit at the campsite that I fucking put together or, or just the campsite I'm at. Fuck yeah, the sure. I part of it. You for know what sure. I mean? So yeah, just getting to, to know somebody like that and, and being around them, you know? Yeah. And hoping that it, uh, wears off on you. Right. For sure. So, <laughs> um, you know, that, that kind of like leads us into like, you know, your whole, I mean, you've been a part of the vice grips club and, and, you know, the club now and stuff. It's like, what, what was it about that side of motorcycling that, that uh, appealed to you to make you want to go down and, and be a part of those kind of worlds? You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I think it, it's, it's probably like the initial thing that draws most people is, is like, is, you know, like uh, being around, like, with with vice grip like uh i'm one of the guys that started the club yeah and uh and and you know we were all just so we're all we are so close you know and those guys still got the club going and stuff yeah. and uh and and uh you know it's it, it was a difference to me like the best way to describe it was it was the difference of like you know when you're riding motorcycles with your friends and stuff like that like you know you break down Something happens, especially with the old bikes we were riding, right? Yeah. Because it was all pre-70 big twin choppers. Damn. And uh, and you had to build it from the ground up yeah. while you prospected. That was part of our, our uh, like, our bylaws. But uh, um, it, it was the difference of, like, you know, you being out at midnight or 2 in the morning and, and breaking down mm-hmm. and, like, calling a brother and knowing that someone's going to come help you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, when you're just riding around with a group of friends, I mean, that's it's that's the most like, like, simple way to describe it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But like, it there was a a, a more responsibility, um, to each other. Yeah, and and the the things that we went through in order to get there, yeah, really brought us together closer. I think you know, and and uh, and numerous other things that we never thought we would go through would bring us closer. Well, it you know kind of I mean? lends to what you just said about like. To, to get respect, you got to earn it or yeah. give it as well. Yeah. So it's like going through a prospect period and and whatnot is how you earn the respect of the other people that have already done it. You For know sure. what I'm saying? So, 100%, man. That that you know I, I I've, I'm con- I'm I got a good group of buddies that do a podcast called Four for the Road, and uh, they're more club based. They do a lot of club culture type stuff, and you know, um, and they usually bring me on as the, the anti-club guy, yeah. not because I'm anti-club. I just, I kind of, my friend says it the best. I kind of found lightning in a bottle with my group of friends yeah. where we have almost like this club, like connection to each other, but without like, you know, you know, the, the, the patch yeah, basically. Of so, of but I don't know, man. Like, I just, I always wonder what it is about it that, that kind of appeals to certain people and, uh, you know, what makes them want to go down that rat path, you know, things like that. So Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I know everybody has their own experiences, right? But, like, um, I mean, I always feel like I was born too late, you know, personally. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, um, and, you know, like, the guys that I've met through – being in the motorcycle clubs that I've been in and, and yeah. the club that I'm in, it's like, uh, you know, these are the, I mean, these, like when someone talks about like an outlaw, it's like, these are outlaws, man. Yeah. Like these are like, you know, generations of men that like, that are like no others, yeah. you know, like, like, uh, like men that, you know, went to Vietnam when they were 17 and came back when they were 21 and, yeah. and, and their first bike was a, panhead you know like it's like it's like all these things that like nowadays we could never imagine you know like like these experiences right and it shaped them into who they are and on top of that they're just great men man like really really cool you know it's i don't know it kind of goes along with the whole like like i i always kind of when i dive into something i yeah i go all in you know what i mean and and uh and probably to my detriment (laughs) a lot of times too but I will say that, like, man, I've met so many fucking cool people that have had, like, such an impact on me through all of this, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah, I would probably say, like, some of the older guys that's done, like you just described, like, the gone through Vietnam and things like that. Like, to me, if I was, or just in general, like, I would, to be able to see someone that's done some things that you admire, but also they're still doing it, like, 
to me, I would I would aspire to be that. Oh yeah, for you sure. know, no look doubt. at them as more mentors and uh, and uh, just just kind of like hope that you can kind of carry that torch the same way that they have. You know, for what I'm sure. Saying? And that's the only way that these kind of things, you know, in my in my experience, the only way that like with a motorcycle club, how it lasts for fifty plus years yeah. is because of the people that are truly immersed in it and get it and and are are you know carry yeah. carry that torch and carry that feeling you know and and do the same to inspire other people coming up you know what i mean yeah 100 percent. you know you know I, I know that you and tom fugel were friends and uh you know i think what how many years was the anniversary of his passing it just passed like a week ago this was six years six years already god damn um i wanted to ask you man like you know, because I've only I've only known him through you know the 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 TV show, and then what I went and researched about him after I, I saw the Twenty One Days Under the Sky thing. And what do you think his legacy means for like the chopper builders and riders and whatnot of today? Like, I know it's probably a hard question to answer. Maybe maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but like he's so impactful or, or was so impactful. Like, what do you think if you had to kind of like put that into words to kind of let people that aren't familiar with his legacy and, and uh, you know, what he's done and, and all that, like, how would you kind of like eulogize him in a way? You know what I mean? I mean, you know, I, I still think he is a, extremely like influential every single day. And that, that, that's what kind of I meant when I said that, uh, you know, like, people can, you know, uh, people can, like, achieve success to where they end up with millions of dollars or yeah. whatever, right? Like, everybody has their own viewpoint of success. That's kind of what we were talking about earlier. But, like, yeah. you know, like, there's people like Tom, like, when someone asks me what what I want to build for a bike, yeah, like, I'll show him a picture of Tom on his pan head at age 19 and be like in 1962. Okay. Yeah. And be like, that's what I want to build. Right. <laughs> like that's what I aspire to build. Yeah. And, uh, and that'll never change. Like, I mean, and, and, you know, like thinking about the time and place of that, right. Of yeah. that 19 years old in, in Iowa. Okay. <laughs> and, and using British parts mixed with Harley parts yeah. because that's what you can they get your hands on. And to create something like that, that like, stands the test of time you know like to this day it's like that's like what i want to build right there yeah. right or uh, you know and, and uh and that in itself is like among all the other aspects of that man's life as far as his his you know all the different trades and creativity and just like you know like philosophies and yeah. everything that you know goes along with that it's like uh that's someone that's someone i know that i'll i mean uh, you know, I, the little amount of time that I got to spend with him and stuff, like, you know, I, I always took advantage of that as, yeah. as much as I could. And, and I knew that, you know, um, I was going to try to make the most of it because it's people like that, that like will be talked about from here to till eternity, you know, or whatever, yeah. till till well, the earth explodes. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, that's what to me how you make an impact as a person right mm -hmm. and like like we're all gonna die one day right like but you know you never really die if people are still talking about you yeah. right like it, it's like to have that kind of impact it's like that's worth more than money than fame than whatever the fuck you know what i mean like like to just continually inspire people even when you aren't even here. Yeah, yeah. I think it's pretty cool. Would you say he is like, you know, when you're in, in, in regards to his impact, would you say it's because of his love for motorcycles in general and how it's just, it completely like engulfed his life? Like he was a, he was a club guy. He was a builder. He was a, a creative, like you said, a all these philosophies, his relationship with, you know, David Mann and, you know, that kind of connection to another lineage and history in our world you know what i mean like so many different lineages yeah. came from all that man yeah. so many different like you could go we could go down wormholes but of like <laughs> of like so many different influential people you know uh you know uh it's uh yeah like i mean it's 
it's like birds of a feather, you know what I yeah, mean? Like yeah. you start to think about it and you're like, like, I get that, you know, that's what I get. Yeah. Like, like I know personally, I'll never have that kind of impact. Right. And, and I don't care one way or the other, honestly, but I know that like what I saw on him and the time I spent around him, like, that's how I feel. He know? seemed like he was happy, like about just a good oh, positive yeah. kind of, Oh man, he, he, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, I would say that that, you know, just outside looking in, that would give me like a, a sense of security of knowing that going down this path of letting motorcycles basically, you know, be number one in my life to know that I could also, you know, whether I die with 10 bucks in the, in my pocket or a hundred thousand, you know, that I'm still going to be happy. That's, I think that that gives me a lot more solace or hope. Well, you know I think I mean? that's why we do any of us do any of this stuff. You know, it's like, it's like, um, you know, it, 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 you have to love what you're doing, right? Yeah. There's no other way to live your life. And to see somebody like that, that is the true description of a one percenter and uh, of an artist and of all these things that are on the fringes of society, right? Yeah. And to see them like, create so much from it um is like the biggest inspiration of it all so uh wanted to jump into another thing um you know you started your your first shop in your garage correct like how was the uh trend the the progress of like transitioning to each kind of place that you've kind of grown into how has that been like do you miss like the simplicity of the garage or, or or do you embrace more of like the, the complications are bigger, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, starting out in my garage, it, it was cool. Uh, obviously, you fill up that area very quickly, right? Yeah. But now I've come to learn, like, any size area you're in, you're going to fill it up no matter what. Uh, obviously, it was nice not having the overhead. Yeah. And, uh, and then being able to just focus on, really focus in on, like, one project at a yeah. time, you know? Um then it comes with the uh, with the added bonus of like you never really turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Not that you do anyway. You, yeah, <laughs> but like you know when it's right outside the garage door, it's like yeah. you call it a night or whatever, and it's like, all right, cool. And you think you're stepping away, and then you're like, wait a second. If I just work on this for like thirty more minutes, I can get yeah. like ahead for tomorrow or whatever. It's always there, right? Yeah. So that that was the downside of it, but it definitely facilitated you know like starting out, you know laying the groundwork for yeah. building up my customers and, and uh, following and stuff like that, you know, building bikes. And, um, and then from there, moving into the first shop I was in, you know, like you start getting into having overhead and, you know, yeah. you, you're hustling for that. And, uh, but you have more space. And so, you know, you just kind of end up working, working with what you got. And yeah. then uh, really getting to this place – Cause it's a good 30 minutes, uh, 30 minute drive from yeah. my house now. And, um, it's really helped me establish like, you know, we start work at nine and we usually call it around five, six, you know? Yeah. But setting like real hours and parameters. Right. Yeah. And not like, like in the past I'd be like, well, this is my own business. I'm never going to set my alarm. You know, I'm going to sleep till yeah. nine o'clock or whatever. And I'm going to go into work at 10 and, you know, work till seven or eight or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that's all fine and good. But like that really screws with like the rest of your life. <laughs> you know it what does. I mean? When you yeah. don't set like some boundaries there uh-huh. and it's taken me pretty much this long, like the last couple of years to like really be like, treat it as a, and that, yeah. that's the aspect that makes it nice to come to a shop. Right. Because you treat it as a, okay, I'm, I'm going to be here by nine every day. Like, like I have a boss telling me I'm going to be here by nine, yeah. right? And then that away, come five o'clock, you know, I feel okay, like stopping, you know, uh, cleaning up and then, yeah, doing and then whatever. leaving and going to do my other full-time jobs. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. No, I know what you mean on that for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, that, that's definitely, I guess, maybe the difference between starting out and doing it from my home. Mm. And, uh, of course, all the other complications that come from that. Yeah, yeah. Code enforcement and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. But they were pretty cool to me, actually. It's not bad. Yeah, they fucked with you at the house? They they tried to a couple times, and then they just didn't want you, like, working on a bike in the driveway. 
Yeah. You know, and it got to where, like, we would pull bikes out of the garage, and then I had my, basically, like, my main fab table, and then I had, like, a workbench, and then I'd have my welder, and I think, you know, at most I had, like, my welder, a bandsaw, and um, a drill press or something in my garage. So I would, we'd pull the bikes out to, like, work on things, and then, and I had, like, two lifts in there, right? That was yeah. all crammed in there. And then they just didn't want us working on stuff in the driveway or whatever, yeah. but they were really cool, actually. It's not bad. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I, I did the garage thing. I got real big, uh, big ass, like on the side of the highway, three buildings, paint shop, you know, mechanic shop, and then uh, parts. And then uh, I hated that place. I hated, I hated the overhead. I hated the life and the people I had to, all the people I had to work for to keep that open. And then I went to my garage from that and found happiness in just simplicity. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? And uh, I've kind of had, I lived on that kind of a, I'm I'm in a shop now, but I've I've let I've let myself to stay as simple as possible and just optimize the quality of work I do so that I can raise the prices up enough to where I can not have to slave at it and I don't get burned out on it. Yeah, you know and you mean? never want to feel like that. Like that that is the downside. Like some days and I and I I'm I have like an ADHD brain, yeah. you know? And that's something I feel like I really struggle with and have had to come to terms with because and the, the cool part of that about that is like having an alternate perspective, which is Reed that works with me. Yeah. Like he's very uh, focused on tasks and like task management and stuff like that. And man, daily he he'll have to like come up to me and be like, "Hey Matt, so what's really the priority right now?" Like like you know like he'll he'll ask me yeah. in terms of like you know he and I scheduling what we're working on right, and I'll be like. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because if not, dude, I'll just try to jump around and I'll be like, okay, I got to pay a bill tomorrow or whatever. I need what's making money right now, you know, and like I'll start messing yeah, with something. Yeah. And like, but in reality, that doesn't pay the bill, right? Like yeah. it may get you quick money real quick, but like you still got to finish that project out, mm -hmm. you know, and if you're bouncing around and you're not focused, you know, that's just going to drag on and yeah, on, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, you, know, you have to learn things like that the hard way, you know, but it's, it's nice to have another perspective um, to help with that. Another level head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what about, like, being here in Austin? I mean, you know, it sounds like you've been here for at least the last 15 years or so, if not more. I'm 39. I've been here since I was 18. Okay, so, yeah, you definitely. Yeah, 21 years, yeah. Um, man, you've seen it change then. Uh, yeah. How, how much, you know, I'm asking this as a Dallas person. <laughs> how much has the change in Austin been something that you enjoy versus you don't? And, you know, if, if there is even anything you don't like about how things have changed. The only thing I would the only thing I would say that I don't like is you know obviously we had an influx of people moving into yeah. the city right and uh, and that's whatever but you know like ho housing prices and stuff going yeah, up yeah. Um, that that's one thing we've all faced uh, but as far as like man you know what I think is bitching huh. like and uh, I've said this before and I try to think of it in a way of like I try to figure out a way to figure out a way to word it without it sounding like, like weird. But when I really knew like things were picking up here and like, like cool stuff was really starting to happen and whatnot, I was seeing like a bike for the first time, like a cool chopper going down the road and being like, or seeing it like pulling up in a parking lot of somewhere and, and, and seeing a bitch in like shovel yeah. chopper or something. And I remember thinking like, wait a second, I didn't make that sissy bar. You know, like, yeah. like I feel like there was a time where, you know, I feel like I've made, like, 200, 300 sissy bars or something, which yeah. is probably accurate at this point. But, like, I I could – I remember a time where I could go to a bar or go to a music venue or something, and I'd see a chopper and instantly be like, oh, that's so-and-so's bike. I yeah. And I'll, you know, I, I'd tell my wife whatever, like, that's uh, – uh, I made that sissy bar. I made those mids or something, you know. And, and just, like, I recognize these bikes right off the bat, right? Yeah. And, and I feel like there was a time where I knew everybody that had a cool bike. Mm. And then – it got to the point where, you know, I go out somewhere and be like, "Oh, that's a fucking bitch in chopper! Like, what? Where the fuck did that come from?" You know, and uh, and then you start seeing all these bikes that like you've never seen before, and I think that's fucking cool as hell. Yeah, yeah. You know, like to me, that's like, there's nothing cooler than that. Like, it doesn't matter if that's the first his first bike or whatever. Like, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. So in terms of anything changing, I don't know, man. I mean, Austin doesn't really have anywhere to grow. Like, it's definitely spread out yeah. now. But, like, Austin's always been a place that uh, no matter how much I travel and, and, uh, and go different places or whatever, even when I was in bands and stuff, I always love coming back here. 
Yeah. There's yeah. something about Austin, man. I, I, I uh, it's, it's where, I, it's where I like to be. I, there's something to it, man. I, I will say this, and being down here, it's the closest thing that makes me feel like I'm in a LA or a fucking, you know, happening place in some part of, you know, you just feel plugged into something, something electric. But it know? doesn't feel overwhelming. It. Last, two weeks ago, I think, was the first time I came down here and actually went and hit the bar scene. I think we went to the White Horse and yeah. we went to a couple other spots. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, this isn't what I remember it to be like. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, Sixth Street was dead, which was, you know, probably a well, good thing. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I guess it's like, you know, I, I, I go back and forth to New Braunfels a lot because that's where Simpsons at. So I'm, I'm always passing through it. I'm like, oh, shit, another building or another – you know, P. Terry's or something's popping up. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But you just, uh, I don't know, like, I, I, I don't come, I, I haven't been in downtown or Congress or, or Lamar or a lot of these air places in a while, and I just haven't really noticed it. And this was the first time I came back and was like, wow. Now, I do, I will say, like, I love culture. I love all the different cultures that came. I love, I love good food. I like good restaurants. Uh, I like boutiques that kind of lend themselves to women and men. That way, when my wife wants to go do that shit, I can, like, Oh, that's cool. They sell hats. I'm going to go check that yeah, out or yeah. something, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I just wonder what it's like for people that's, that's here, you know. It, it's a, uh, I mean, you know, you, you know the places that even like, even like some place like Whitehorse, you know, that's kind of become somewhat touristy, I guess yeah, I would say. Yeah. Um, uh, but like my good friends run that place and, yeah. and I still go there pretty often, you know. And uh, while it's cool to see it be successful and stuff. It's definitely, I don't know though, but I also love people watching, man. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's, we I don't know that what thing. that is, but I love that, man. And I, I love to just sit back and like, like just, I love being in situations where I am not like necessarily comfortable or like not necessarily uncomfortable, but just like maybe where I don't normally would fit in or something yeah, yeah. and just be outside my element, I guess is the way yeah. to say it. Right. And, and then just watch how people react. Cause like, yeah. And not towards me, but just in general, like just watching people and seeing like people in their element or whatever. And uh, so I like putting myself in those positions every now and then. Um, but I feel like it's also the same with anything, man. It's like it's what you make of it. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. like all this stuff. Like, yeah, sure. Cong South Congress is different than it was. Right. Like like before we started Vice Grip, we used to always ride down to uh, Home Slice Pizza yeah. on Thursday nights on our choppers, you know, and just hang out there and eat pizza and hang out. Right. And, uh, and that was, you know, almost 15 years ago. So it's like looking back, you know, it's, it's way different now, right. Yeah. On South Congress, but the things just move around and shift. And with all the things that change, there's equally as many things that come in that are, yeah. that are positive and, and fun and you just have to seek it out. Right. You almost have to embrace the change as well. Like you got to accept that change is inevitable, I guess. And, yeah. uh, I guess I think the, the old man in me just gets nostalgic and I'm like, man, I miss yeah, that and you one. like certain places. Yeah. yeah but hey, if you're into the real dive bars and shit, like none of those places are going to change, man. You yeah. go to O four lounge, it's not going to be that much different. You know, you go to G and S lounge, which, I've tried to go there like probably 20 times and I've only actually gone in one time because like the guy who owns it lives above it. And the one time I got to go in there, and it, I mean, sometimes you just show up and the door's locked For real? and he's known as being like a curmudgeon and stuff. And like, but the one time I got to go there, like, you know, four pool tables, uh, all these bitch at pinball machines, great fucking jukebox. Like, and it's on <laughs> South Congress, but like further South yeah. and, um, or no, sorry. It's on South first. But uh, um, it's like, you know, there's, there's still places like that that are like dive bars that no one really, you know, have, has, you know, uh, hasn't been oversaturated or yeah, whatever. Yeah. That really, I don't know, those are the things that I have fun doing. Yeah, it makes sense, man. Like I said, it's one of those questions I just, I, I want to ask, but I don't want to ask and imply like, oh, you hate this too? Like, there's you said nothing it, to hate though. Yeah, you know, it's, like, not, it's, it's not a hate. Yeah, like it, you it's, said. With, with as many things that are different like i said it's like for all the things that are different and have changed i can find that many plus more things that are positive that yeah that we get to experience you know what i mean uh -huh. and uh and you have great people doing all i mean just the, dude the restaurants alone you know what i yeah. mean the restaurants alone the music venues stuff like that like like Sure, I like grew up coming up here when I was still in high school 
to Emos on yeah. Red River, okay? And, like, that obviously doesn't exist anymore. And, and there's not a venue like that down there. And there's, and Emos isn't the same as it was, you know, like, like, but at the same time, there's been all these other places that have popped up that have kind of taken on the same, you know, maybe not that same nostalgic feel, yeah. but, but, uh, but just good people doing good things, you know, and, and you want to be a part of it. And really, I mean, you just got to go out and have fun and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. go like out it's there with what you, It's what you make it, you know? Sure. I feel like every, every aspect of life is what you make it. Like, if you go somewhere and you expect, like, something and you're going to just be pissed off and, like, bring that vibe and stuff and, uh, and, and, you know, think about what it was or whatever, it's like, why waste time doing that, you know, when you yeah. could be out having fun? Yeah, it's always a concept of going into everything with an open mind and allowing whatever, whatever that is to to show you what it is now without sure. like a preconceived notion or expectation or whatever. But yeah, like I said, I just wondered because, you know, for a while we've just kind of skipped over Austin quite a bit. You know, we just, we know that there's bikes down here and there's a bike scene, but we just haven't seen it, you know? And, and when I say seen it, I mean like we haven't seen it on social media, so we didn't know where See, it's at. That's you know the hard, yeah, that's the hard part, man. And like, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm in touch with it. Cause, cause I feel like maybe I get, um, Maybe I, I have I become preoccupied with yeah. with like my business and 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 uh, with the motorcycle club and like you know traveling and everything and but uh, I see new people all the time man new people that come in here that are building bikes and and I get to meet them and 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 fucking and learn all kinds of things from yeah it's wild man all types of people yeah I, I know what you mean by that man I, I like I said I. I I'd wanted to come down. I actually rode down here. I think the last time I was in Austin was when I rode in with Yellow Wolf. <laughs> oh, I randomly was at Yellow Jacket. Yellow Jacket, yeah. Yeah, yeah, whenever that happened. What was going on with that? He was doing this tour thing, and they were doing the Devil's Triangle or some shit where they were doing Austin, Houston, Dallas oh, okay. thing. And uh, a guy that built the bike for him, which was a horrible fucking bike. but um, Did it make it? I mean, it made it because it was a new bike oh, okay. that he tried to make it look That's like cool. a vintage chopper yeah. kind of thing. Um, so he just said, "Hey, man, I'm we're you know I'm riding in from Tennessee with Yellow Wolf. You want to come meet up? We're in Jacksonville, Texas, or Jackson, something like that. I think it's Jackson out there, close to like Henderson and oh, okay. all that where that is." And I was like, "Yeah, sure, I'll come out." And I rode in with him, and it was just rad. You know, I'd never been to Yellow Jacket before. That was yeah, cool. And then there's that tattoo shop right there next. Yeah, to they had it. a little tattoo shop there. Yeah. And. Uh, that was wild, but it was it was it was kind of weird too because I never really hung out with a guy that was on his level of rock star, if you will. And uh, it was, I don't remember were people all like weird and stuff. No, he was chill. He no, was I super- mean like like people were weird to him ah. or something. No, I feel like I feel like that's the cool thing about Austin. It's like you could be the, you could yeah. be at places like that with somebody that has some sort of some sort of uh, like fame or, or notoriety, and maybe it's just. I want to say it's a Texas thing, but maybe it's not. I've only really experienced it in Austin where people are, like, chill and, like, leave you alone. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. It. What is his name Mike that runs the uh, um, White Horse? Uh, my, uh, well, my, my buddy Busty is, the, is, the, uh, the, yeah. is the, like, the general manager. He actually was an intern for me at the oh, Austin Speed Shop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's one guy that he's, I guess he's a bartender. Kind oh, of Mikey, yeah. Mikey, Mikey yeah. yes. So, yes, Mikey's one of the managers there, too. He was talking. bartender, yes. He Mikey was, Luplo. He was He's telling us just some too. stories of like some of the celebrities has come into the White Horse. Oh, and, I have no doubt, I bet. And uh, and I can imagine, especially with the the Rogan and all the comedy scene coming here, and and already the people that's already been here before then that you know seeing celebrities walking around is a, lot, a much more normal thing, especially if it's a bar scene that's actually you know it's it's not as big as L A. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's only so many areas these people can go to, and if that's the area that's happening. You know, there's going to be some cowboys in there, some bikers, and some yeah, fucking celebrities. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I don't no, know. I, I've, I've had, I mean, I've, I don't, I haven't seen that many or been around that many people, you know, of, like, a celebrity level or whatever. But, like, the the little bit of interaction I've had with some people like that in, like, those settings. Yeah. Uh, everybody in Austin's pretty chill, man. Like, it's not, like, I, I, I've, I, I mean, because I, I, like, it goes, that goes back to the people watching thing. Like, yeah. like I'm always, like, curious about, like, how people are going to react or how people will act around in certain situations, you know. And uh, I've been 
pleasantly surprised with how people yeah. act. It's like it's very you know. I uh, I didn't know Tim Duncan rode until y- I saw y'all posted a picture together one time. Yeah, yeah. That's he, right. he, he rides BMWs and stuff. Oh, he has real? a car shop in San Antonio. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. Nice, Custom nice. car shop, and uh, um, yeah, he, that's a great dude, man. Really for cool. Real? Yeah, really cool. That's rad seeing all that kind of come together and that world come yeah. in. Yeah, I took dope. him to Yellow Jacket one time actually. <laughs> And I didn't even know the yellow jacket was a Spurs bar <laughs> <For real. laughs> until oh, their until their uh, employees started coming in. I don't know where the line happens between Spurs versus you know Dallas. I think probably Waco. Uh, probably Waco South is yeah, maybe. is a uh, Spurs. But, but I mean, Spurs have won a lot more than th- Dallas. Definitely, huh? we've only won one. <laughs> I'm not claiming I'm just anything. Kidding. I don't know that much about it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like yeah. I mean, I took him. To, uh, well, um, our good friend Burns. Um, I built a panhead for him yeah. and him and Tim are, are old friends and, and good friends. And so they rode up one day and then it was like five o'clock traffic. And it was, my shop was still on Cesar Chavez. And, uh, and so I was like, well, you guys want to go get a, a beer or something at yellow jacket down the street and like kind of wait out traffic. And they're like, yeah. And we go down there and I didn't know yellow jacket was a Spurs bar, even though I've been going there for years. Yeah. And, uh, and it was like at five o'clock on a, Thursday or Friday or Thursday or something. And so there really nobody was there. And I noticed that like employees that worked there that weren't working that day started kind of like trickling in. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And then I went back up to the bar to get like a round of drinks for us and stuff. And one of the bartenders was one of the owners of uh, the place. And they were like, you know, we love you. Right, Matt. And I was like, <laughs> what? And they're like, we love you. I'm like, Okay. And then I go and sit back down, and I'm like, I notice people start trickling back. I'm like, oh, okay. Later on, they were like, you brought you know, the- this is a Spurs bar, right? I was like, <laughs> I had no idea. That's rad. But anyway, yeah. So what? Uh, I know that you had uh, plans originally for the Time Tra- Traveler show. Like, is that still something that could happen? Or yeah, I know COVID fucked all that the, up. Yeah, basically. man. And and it was like literally, we had to call it like three weeks before. I remember that. Or yeah. something, or less than that, two weeks yeah. before or something. Um, yeah, uh, I still have a plan to, to try to do that. It's just, it's just, you know, finding the, the right time. Yeah. Um, you know, th- there's been other shows like obviously like Fandango that I want to support yeah. and, and appreciate those guys and, and, uh, and want to be a part of. And, uh, we just have so many cool different things going on. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. It's all good. <laughs> it's good ambiance. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let the listeners decide. Dude, that's but, uh, some critter music. Well, Hopefully it's not one of my brother. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Hopefully, uh, no, I, I think it's rad, man. If you end up doing it, it'd be it'd be dope, especially if you're doing it in that March spot that we've kind of been missing yeah, something. Yeah, that, that was like, that was my, my intention. Um, you know, uh, and and since, oh, shorty. <laughs> he looks rad. He's cool, man. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, the uh, I think maybe uh, I think whenever the COVID thing happened, like yeah. it was uh, it was more of uh, uh, my mindset has been wanting to promote and support the shows that are going on. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's a good point. And yeah. uh, and and everybody's been doing such good stuff that you know it's uh, well, maybe I it's tra- a good I chance to do for you. I can with it's all a that. good chance for you to sit back and enjoy some of the things that that I know that your input before has created things like i know texas hills is back on the is coming back and and whatnot and it it, you know with fandango taking place and now born free being in texas like there's a lot going on there's a lot going on and 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 every one of them brings a different aspect to the table right and i still feel like if we did our show um it would uh it would it's all good it would uh it would lend to you know it's still it would still have its own thing going on yeah yeah for sure so. well cool well you know i'll see you got customers here now so i'll <laughs> let you get to it matt i do want to pre- i really appreciate you doing this man and uh yeah i appreciate you i like to do it more you know when things start happening more you know sure. do some some of this shit more get you in the studio too it might be yeah, a little I'd bit easier to, i'd love to uh but yeah dude once again thank you for all the shit you've done for giddy up and and, uh, you know, building bikes that inspire people to want to build and ride them. You know what I mean? So, Well, thank you for all the okay. things you're doing, man. Because, like, it, that's way more impactful, I believe, probably. And uh, <laughs> But I appreciate that. Oh, thanks, man. All right, well, 
I guess they, uh, everybody knows where to find you, Instagram. Yeah, whatever. whatever. Jacksonshoppers.com or something. I always feel like that's the, that's the podcaster thing to do when you end a podcast is, hey, shout oh, your Instagram it. out, yeah, even yeah. though it's going to oh, be yeah, on Jackson everything. Oh, yeah, Shoppers is my Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt, but appreciate yeah. it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. All right.